So I think to keep us relatively on schedule, since we have an uh, extremely busy day and short amount of times and already short breaks in between, I'm going to try to kick us off immediately. Since we said we'd start at 2, we'll start right at 2, and at least any delays won't be my fault. <laughs> um, so my name's Sean Flynn. I'm the Associate Director on the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. Today is the launch of a project uh, with the same name as the title of today's public event, focusing on the law and economics of copyright users' rights. And before explaining a little bit more about that project and the structure of our day, uh, let me thank our sponsors and supporters. So we have uh, Fernando Perini here from IDRC, uh, the International Development Research Center for, from Canada. Uh, as one of our supporters, uh, Google Incorporated um, has helped support this project. Um, and then also the Washington College of Law has funded most of the, the space and the food that you will eat today. Um, also, a, a, a special thanks to a lot of the staff that helped put this on. So Katie Evans, who I think is outside working hard as we speak, uh, especially for all of the people who are part of our panels, et cetera. You know Katie well already and has put in a ton of work on the project. Uh, Meredith Jacob as well, our assistant director who's coming in now, keeps everything moving uh, uh, within PIDGIP, including uh, this project as well. And Mike Palmetto is also somewhere close at hand. Mike Palmetto um, has really uh, is one of the the guiding lights of this project, has helped organize um, the economists that we have uh, before you today, has taken a major role in planning um, the research project and the implementation of this project, uh, and we're proud of him for that. Um, a couple quick notes on upcoming events. So PIDGIP will be hosting the new launch of uh, Creative Commons United States, the first United States affiliate of Creative Commons. That will take place on the evening of October 17th. Um, we have the, the annual uh, Peter Yazzie Distinguished Lecture on Intellectual Property featuring uh, Bert Hugenholtz from IVIR in Amsterdam. That will be taking place on the evening of November 7th. And um, a, uh, a first of its kind uh, here, a uh, conference on patent and federal policy being hosted uh, by George Contreras and Jonas Anderson, our two new uh, patent faculty here, will take place on November 8th. Uh, all the information on those events can be found on our website, which is pidgip.org, P-I-J-I-P.org, and on the right-hand column you can find links to all our upcoming events. Okay, so today. So today, as I mentioned, is, is really the launch of, of a new for us research project. And the project is uh, an effort to combine two strains of, of research and, and thought. And as the title suggests, one is from the legal side and one is from the economic side. I think there's, um, this project is born from a, a, a perception on the law side that a lot of lawyers, legal academics, legal advocates um, are advocating for and producing scholarship on the limitations and exceptions to copyright and the importance of them to create a balanced copyright system, but often find ourselves lacking the economic evidence to support those arguments. What is the economic evidence around limitations and exceptions and their links to the social and economic objectives of copyright specifically in society more largely. And then we started a dialogue with uh, Walter Park, who will chair the next, next panel, um, around investigating creating some of those links. And I, and I think there was also a, a desire on the side of the economists to have more interaction with the lawyers to help identify what are the pieces of copyright that should be studied? What are the specific types of limitations and exceptions that the lawyers might think um, have particular objectives but should be looked at from the economist side? So the, this project is aimed to bring those two together, to have um, legal researchers and economic researchers informing each other and informing a research project together and creating the scope of that project. And this public launch is, is, as I said, the beginning of that project. Um, the members of the two panels uh, and the keynote that you'll be seeing uh, following the introduction will be spending the next two days together designing a research project around these issues. We will be asking 
those questions, what kind of limitations and exceptions should we be studying? How should we study them? What kinds of data are available now? What does the research look like? What should it look like? And this is really a moment to bring the larger public into that conversation. So we really welcome you to engage in dialogue with us. Uh, we know many of you are already experts of various kinds, advocates of various kinds in the field. So we hope you will help us answer and inform some of these questions as we go through the day. Um, the, we will start uh, with an economics panel, which, which Walter will describe, which the essential function of kind of reviewing where the information is, the, the economic literature is that we start with. And then again, highlighting some of the avenues for research that economists should be looking towards. And then we will have a roundtable discussion with legal academics um, from a variety of countries where copyright reform is happening to give us a little bit of report on what kind of uh, policies are being proposed, but then also especially what kind of data is being discussed within those policy debates. What's being used by various sides in the debates and what kind of information is missing. And then after a, a, a break, we will have um, a keynote presentation by Sunia Abraham, uh, who will report on, on some very interesting intersectional research that they're doing in India on the relationships between limitations and exceptions of both copyright and patent to um, innovation, particularly within the cell phone industry uh, within India. And at the close of the day, we'll have a reception to which you are all invited to. It will run from about 6.15 to 9 o'clock. Um, and we hope to see you all there as an opportunity to have some more informal discussions and carry on the day. So with that, I'll turn it over to Walter to introduce the first part of our day. Thank you all for coming. Okay, thank you, Sean, and thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this uh, conference. Uh, so as, as Sean mentioned, uh, the purpose of this first uh, panel is to provide some uh, background on economics research on copyright. So let me introduce our, our speakers from, I guess, your right to left. Uh, so first we have Christian Hanke, who is a leading scholar in the economics of copyrights. He uh, is a professor of cultural economics at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and a senior researcher at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he's really published widely in this field, uh, has produced reports for the National Academies of Science in Washington, D.C., uh, the Strategic Advisory Board for Intellectual Property Policy, and the Intellectual Property Office in London. UK. And um, next, Yust Port is a senior economics researcher at the Institution for Information Law, University of Amsterdam. Uh, he's done numerous studies on competition policy and regulation, economics of culture and heritage, uh, economics of copyright, te telecommunications and the media. And he's uh, one of the co-authors on a well-known study on flexible copyrights and Open Norms in Netherlands uh, that, that was commissioned by the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs, Agriculture, and Innovation. Then we have uh, Piotr Sturzowski, who's an economist at the, uh, in the Directorate for Science and Technology at the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris. And he also has uh, numerous works in the field of intellectual property and innovation. He has uh, several articles and, and books on piracy and counterfeiting, innovation in the software industry, uh, measuring the size of the Internet economy, among others. Um, also, he has other research contributions in the field of migration, human capital, and, and the brain drain. Uh, and lastly, uh, Roki Alavi is a professor of economics at the International Islamic University in Malaysia. Um, she's the coordinator of her university's globalization and WTO unit. Uh, her field is international trade and economic development, and she has published books on the subject of import substitution and in infant industries in Malaysia, uh, on trips in pharmaceuticals, and has recently co-authored a book on the intellectual property system and industrial development in Malaysia. So I'm going to turn over to them, and I would request that everyone speak for about 15 minutes, plus or minus two, and then I'll open up uh, for, the, for questions and answers from the audience. Yes. Thank you, Walter. Um, how do I start my slides here? Thank you. Great. 
we could go to presentation mode, then everything's hunky dory. Um, Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind and very generous uh, introduction and for having me. Um, my name is Christian Handke and I will report on the quantitative empirical literature that I reckon is relevant um, um, for understanding the effects of unauthorized copying and its reverse, copyright protection, um, <clears throat> and what it tells us about welfare effects of, uh, well, what we might call flexible copyright or copyright exceptions and limitations. Um, I will give you, I will start with my usual disclaimer. Um, I'm reminded of that. I'm wo currently working at the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam as well, like Joost is. And um, what that ta taught me, amongst other things, is that I should occasionally remind audiences with legal expertise that I'm not an expert on copyright exceptions and limitation, limitations, nor on copyright law per se, for better or for worse, um, as an economist, I have a tendency to gloss over detail and try to zoom in on basic principles. I'm not sure whether I can speak for my colleagues here, but um, that's certainly the case uh, for me. Um, I got, gather there are various oh, problems with animation. Oh, that's not the right button. Uh, something happened in the meantime. Okay, various uh, um, uh, rationalizations and objectives for exceptions and limitations. Uh, Non-exclusive uh, list here, of course, a non-comprehensive list here. First of all, is to promote innovation by allowing for private study, for example, no protection of original compilations and so on, to retain fundamental freedoms, now, I'm already moving out of the comfortable uh, comfort zone of economists, I'm afraid. But to retain fundamental freedoms, for instance, some um, quotation rights and rights for parody, to protect vulnerable groups, such as people with disabilities who may have to copy or modify works to access them, and to protect specific institutions um, and, um, um, that um, are trying to promote public, uh, the public good, public interests like governments, libraries, schools, and universities, and so on. And over lunch, we just discussed the problems that we have at many universities these days to make research materials um, available to students. Um, Hair-raising problem in the Netherlands these days. Um, not sure what the situation is like here. Now, in the economic perspective, this all comes down to two basic objectives. I would suggest, um, first of all, to promote follow-up innovation and creativity. Um, for example, transformative use and new ways of disseminating copyright works and note how the two are important, right? That we might create new copyright works building on cultural heritage that is protected by copyright or um, we might have new ways of disseminating um, the copyright works, making them available for uh, for enjoyment, human consumption, whatever you want to call it. And then secondly, we have um, 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 the objective to allow for use where the social benefits exceed any adverse consequences for rights holders. Both of these reasonably standard in the economics of copyright, even though needless to say that there's no general agreement on these issues. Please note that the former objective um, is entirely about dynamic, uh, a dynamic perspective uh, that includes future consequences of present actions. So if you just stare at the short run, the immediate presence, um, then um, that's simply not the perspective taken on that one. The second one, the second objective, can be assessed with or without attending to future consequences, and that's a very important uh, distinction to make, short run and long run analysis. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, so some people would compare user and rights holder interests over the short run. That is very different from um, trying to incorporate uh, innovation effects and the future value of, um, of works uh, generated because of the incentive created by copyright. Okay, let me go to the main part of my presentation. 
Um, I have a matrix here for you um, regarding the um, costs and benefits of a copyright system, and I report what the economic, the empirical economic research, some would call it econometric, um, that's an intimidating term um, for the same thing, um, what they have found regarding these different cells, and then very importantly, because it's often uh, overlooked, or people zoom in on one of those uh, boxes, how, it, how they fit together. You have to, we have to see them in context if you want to say anything meaningful about policy. Now, um, I hinted at the distinction between short-run and long-run uh, analysis already. In the short-run, the short-run refers to a period over which the supply of copyright works is fixed. Yeah, so present. Right now, no innovation, no new works introduced to the market. We are just dealing with, the, uh, with access to what has been produced already. Um, then the intended benefit of copyright is to generate greater rewards to rights holders, um, and that is creators and other investing uh, in, in creativity, and that, work, um, and that works because rights holders enjoy some market power, um, as no one is permitted to supply perfect substitutes, identical copies, identical works. Um, now, the last time I counted out the academic literature, which admittedly has been a few months ago, I found 22 studies gorging um, this, uh, gorging, trying to measure, assess this effect. And regarding um, uh, selection criteria, you could discuss whether there should be 30 or there should be 15. I'm reporting what's been published in, in peer reviewed journals and, um, and studies that report uh, significant levels, statistically significant levels for the, excuse me? Yeah. Excuse me? Oh, your iPad. And all these studies are available on the internet. <laughs> if yes, that's correct. Um, wonderful. Um, so, um, now all of these studies, oh, sorry, virtually all of these studies are about file sharing. So they're reasonably up to date. We might read them with an interest to understanding the current situation. And many find that regarding co recorded music or movies, and that's what has been studied, uh, not software, not news, not, uh, not even the book market. I think software is the big omission, really, because of the um, um, economic import of that sector. <clears throat> there, but what all of these find regarding recorded music and movies, most of these, is that unauthorized digital copying does displace demand for authorized copies. The extent of this displacement is debatable. Results range between no significant effect, which is a minority result, and um, quite substantial displacement effect. Some say 50% of the value of the trade value um, vaporized. Um, but that's the other extreme result. Most studies fall into the middle between the two. Now, copyright isn't only about creating revenues to rights holders, of course, and in the short run, we are still interested, perhaps, in the access costs to users, the administration costs and transaction costs, so the costs of the uh, copyright system. Um, Access cost to users refer to the, uh, um, the mechanism that um, um, rights holders, sorry, that users have to pay higher prices uh, due to the market power of copyrights holders. Um, I don't have a, ah, okay, I just have to click a certain number of times. And there have been two studies on that particular subject. One, one issue to note perhaps is that it's not perfectly balanced, right? What these both studies have found on access costs to users is that uh, they far exceed, in the short run, they far exceed the losses to rights holders. Um, you can discuss the measure, how to measure willingness to pay and so on, but it's a result that's perfectly consistent with the economic analysis that in the short run, as we, um, um, there is no a strong case for copyright and it's about promoting innovation and creativity. And if we just do a short run analysis, we're not doing very much um, that would be meaningful for policy. 
In practice, there are also administration costs covered by public authorities and transaction costs in trading rights associated with the copyright system, so costs that uh, the parties trading, or at least wanting to trade, uh, would have to incur. And the obvious thing to say, oh, and, and there are no studies on that, no technical studies that have made it into academic journals on that uh, in the economic literature that I surveyed. Um, so there are, not, there are many uh, there are less studies that develop measures of user welfare in the short run, uh, and the two studies that have been published, as I may repeat, suggest that the short run benefits users far exceed rights holders losses, which is consistent with uh, economic theory. Now, um, the decisive thing to say is that in the long run, things might be quite different. If unauthorized use, um, if unauthorized use undermines incentives to invest in creativity, supply of new creative works may dry up, and I think that's the core issue um, in empirical research on the effects of unauthorized copying and copyright. But as you see here, uh, this is not the major drift, the major uh, stream of the, um, uh, of the economic research that I'm aware of. Um, now, if supply would diminish, the stream of new creative works would diminish because of unauthorized copying, digital copying, for example, uh, any short-run benefits of unauthorized copying to users may be unsustainable, and um, society at large, rights holders and users may be benef might benefit from an adequate level of copyright protection. That's the standard economic analysis so far. Um, my screen has gone dead, but, uh, well, I can kind of cope with that, I guess. Um, slightly more advanced economic theorizing, however, suggests that stronger copyright protection does not universally um, uh, increase supply of new works. That is because effects, um, effect of copyright does not only increase the rewards of rights holders, it also increases the costs of follow-on creativity. So. You have two choices as a, as a creator. Either you work around existing copyright claims or you clear rights if you build on other, uh, other people's work, both of which is, is costly in an economic sense. Now, as I said already, there are only eight studies that have discussed this, and only three of these have anything to do with file sharing. And the others go back in history uh, to other changes in, co in, in copyright law in particular um, and see whether there's any effect there. The main point of that literature is that none of these eight studies, not a single one, finds any evidence that stronger copyright protection would correlate with, um, with less, uh, sorry, would correlate with greater supply of creative works. And that is a rather worrying um, state of affairs. Now, these results are clearly preliminary. I probably won't have the time to run through the entire literature, which I could summarize here, since there are only eight studies, it's not actually that hard. Um, but the main point uh, here is that you can read that up, obviously, and the main point is that none of them finds uh, a significant effect. And that, I think, is the, the worrying result here. The other thing to say, of course, is that all, the result, all these studies are very preliminary at best. Um, and there are two serious counter-arguments, I would say if we look at the particular file sharing and the three studies that looked at file sharing and how it does not uh, coincide with a reduction in the supply of new creative works. The th one thing to say is that things could have been even better. We have falling costs of disseminating works, maybe falling costs of creating works. So perhaps, well, if, uh, perhaps there is this countervailing fact that there are these countervailing factors of falling costs of production and things might have been even better. And that is an open question that I hope many people will, will be studying. Uh, the second would be that we haven't seen the full adverse effect of, of file sharing and, and greater digital unauthorized copying yet. And I think we should take those seriously. I would still say that the empirical evidence so far does not support the view that, um, that file sharing would threaten innovation and the supply of new creative works, right? 
I hope you get that message. How it's, I'm trying to be reasonably nuanced here. State of the art is no effect. There's room for more work. Okay, I'm trying to change the slide. So another way to put this is that the transmission mechanism from greater revenues, we have support for the view that uh, revenues of rights holders do decrease with, um, with digital copying. Um, the transmission mechanism into less supply uh, is not what we would expect uh, from the um, quantitative evidence that we have. If I move on to my conclusions for this very brief presentation, let me repeat the basic empirical evidence. Unauthorized copying uh, does displace demand for authorized copies in all probability for recorded music and movies, um, even though the scale of this effect is unclear. And of course, it's unclear whether we can um, generalize these results to other periods of time, to overall revenues of rights holders, including related markets. Most rights holders serve, do not only sell copies, they might license rights, they might, um, they might uh, if they musical performance, for example, they might, uh, they might have life, they might go on tour, and so on. And third, other copyright industries um, might show us a different, uh, uh, might be different, so video games, other types of software, news literature, and academic articles, right? I don't think we can generalize comfortably to those. Secondly, um, there's no evidence that digital copying um, would depress the supply of creative works um, so far, and uh, we need to study that more. There is, I would argue, thus a puzzle uh, at the heart of the empirical literature, and that is, uh, mm -hmm. well, okay, I'm in the second point, second bullet point, bullet, bullet point still. A puzzle at the heart of the empirical literature on the effects of digital copying. Uh, how come that supply does not respond to demand in the expected manner? It doesn't get more fundamental for economists, and most economists would, of course, now say there must be something wrong with the empirics. And I have the same intuition, right? Further works necessary. Um, one could also argue that things could have been even better, as I said, or that we haven't seen the full adverse impact yet. Let me repeat that. However, it seems likely that the copyright system needs to, I think it also seems likely that the copyright uh, system needs to improve to attain its intended effects without excessive unintended consequences. A closer look at the existing empirical work produces initial evidence um, for several other potential explanations of this puzzle, not just um, that things could have been even better, for example. There may be some mitigating mechanisms such as indirect appropriability where rights holders can adapt their pricing to appropriate some of the value um, of copying, um, positive network effects where demand increases with exposure, sales of more excludable complements. Uh, there might be consumer learning or sampling that improves purchasing choices and makes high quality suppliers better off. Um, and last but not least, creativity may be sometimes intrinsically motivated with user generation, of course, being all the hype at this point in time. Um, there might also be unintended consequences of the copyright system occasionally, um, for example, that it inhibits contestability of, uh, of regulated markets or uh, adversely affect innovation by suppliers of uh, complementary goods and services, media hardware, internet service providers, and so on. So the question is, how to improve the copyright system so that we can exploit the opportunities of digital information and communication technology for the creation and dissemination of creative works in a sustainable manner. Um, I, argue, I would argue that, I hope that in the, over the next um, today and the next two days in the non-public sessions we can discuss um, how tailoring copyright exceptions and limitations might have a contribution to make. Um, I would argue, I mean, I would argue that the empirical evidence is consistent with the view that we might sometimes protect the wrong things or go about it in the wrong way. And it's hardly surprising looking at the swift and substantial technological change that we see throughout the copyright industries and related markets, right? It would be almost a miracle if all the detailed castle of copyright law and all the related um, um, social institutions would 
miraculously work in a radically changed environment. Now, I hope the empirical evidence that I presented here in a very summarized and maybe partial manner um, uh, will inspire that. Two last things to say that at, um, at University of Amsterdam, together with yours, I have the pleasure to currently study um, the, um, how copyright compensation systems could improve the situation. So a basic idea, uh, the basic idea would be to encourage um, compensation of rights holders uh, and emphasize that in public policy rather than uh, control of use. Um, similar to Calabresi and Melamed's uh, discussion of property versus liability rules, for example. Now, I'm agnostic about this. I think empirical research might tell us whether that's worth a shot. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. And furthermore, regarding our discussion on, I'm almost done, by the way, um, regarding our discussion on um, um, limitations and exceptions of copyright, um, I would like to, I also hope we can think about the, the, the problem that we might face a flexibility and simplicity, simplicity trade-off that the costs of change as well as transaction administration costs with a customized copyright system could easily be very substantial. Um, and I think that is a fundamental challenge we have. So let me repeat a simplicity, flexibility trade-off that we have when trying to create a flexible, uh, tailored copyright system with, for example, limitations and exceptions applied to particular sub-markets where we might observe that things aren't quite as uh, working quite as much uh, as we like. Um, so, last thing to say, last thing to say is that a detailed literature review I, I can't possibly give you the nuance of the results, and I've definitely been, um, um, well, I wouldn't want to say superficial, but I did my best in a short period of time. If you want to read more about this, get a reasonably up-to-date and, and broad overview of the literature that might help people put the different parts of the, of, the, um, of the literature together and also identify gaps, then that's what I would recommend you might also be looking at. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you, Christian. And our next speaker is Yusport. Okay, thank you, uh, first of all, um, very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, the screen is uh, black, uh, indeed, as, as Christian also experienced. Um, touch, oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> touch screen. Great technology. There we are. Um, I was just pushing the buttons. <laughs> uh, that helps, thanks. Yeah, I uh, used the keyboard for, for flipping through. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to, to talk uh, for about 15 minutes about uh, the ec economic value of flexibility versus exceptions and limitations as a kind of a niche within the um, uh, copyright debate. Um, this is the structure of my, my talks. First, some background on, on the, uh, the, the talk I'm going to give. Um, briefly on the economic logic of copyright, and that's ground already covered by Christian, so I think I can be quite brief on that. Um, then I give some examples that may require flexible copyright as opposed to a system of just exceptions and limitations. I go into the costs and benefits of such flexibility for both copyright holders and the users of copyrighted materials, and then I draw some general conclusions. So, background. Um, this presentation is loosely based on a study we did for the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, that's published as Flexible Copyright, the Law and Economics of Introducing an Open Norm in the Netherlands. And by the start of our project, the, the, the ministry had really high expectations, and they, they kind of wanted us to come up with some GDP impact on flexible copyright. If we add some flexibility, how many jobs, how many GDP points, and uh, how much export would it uh, uh, yield us? Um, well, we could only disappoint them by then, um, and that's what we did. Um, 
one of the things making things even more complex is that we had to define flexibility along the way because there was no clear cut proposal how to implement flexibility uh, that we would have to evaluate. No, we were to come up with an open norm for flexible copyright uh, as part of the project and then evaluate it in, term, in economic terms. And it was supposed not to be flexible copyright instead of a draconian system of copyright without any exceptions or limitations, nor was it about flexible copyright um, uh, instead of the current system of, of exceptions and limitations, but it was more like adding flexibility to the current system of exception, exceptions and limitations. So that's what we did to operationalize this, this open norm. We said, okay, within the EU framework, you, you could kind of move your way and add some, some, some flexibility to the current system without changing the European uh, uh, directives um, by introducing the three-step test as an addition to the current exceptions and limitations. That's more or less how we, how we operationalized um, this, this open norm. Now back again to the economics of, of, uh, of copyright, the economic logic of copyright, and this is well also covered by, by Christian. Um, Basically, copyright is a temporarily granted monopoly on the re uh, re reproduction and distribution of a work, right? So it's a kind of switching off competition for a while. And um, what we know about monopoly power, of course, is that it causes higher prices, which decreases demand. It uh, increases profits, generally, for the monopolist or producer of such goods, and it lo lowers consumer surplus. So in sum, and that's, again, a static analysis, as also Christian uh, pointed out, um, monopoly power creates welfare loss because of the debt weight losses of the consumers that do, do not uh, uh, participate in the market because the price, prices are, are driven up. So basically, it's caused, uh, monopoly power causes a, a loss of welfare uh, and on top of that, a redistribution of welfare from consumers to producers. So that's something we have to bear in mind that, I mean, the static perspective of copyright is welfare loss plus redistribution. Um, so from that static perspective, one should conclude that from a welfare perspective, less copyright is better for welfare. Of course, there's also a dynamic perspective. And the dynamic analysis um, is that protection of revenues from copyright gives rights holders an incentive for production, distribution, and exploitation of works. So the new works, that's, that's what, what is at stake here. If we only had a static picture, then we would have to abolish copyright from the sake of welfare. I'm not talking about moral discussions or, or, or uh, whether it's expropriation or something, but just from a welfare perspective. But on the other hand, dynamically speaking, um, that may also hinder producers of new works and uh, new technologies who use works as an input. Uh, again, because those producers operate as consumers of copyrighted works and they would face uncertainty if they would just go about using works without getting licenses or they would uh, uh, suffer from that weight losses if they would go on licensing and decide not to license certain works because the prices are higher than they're willing to pay. So even in a dynamic perspective, it's, it's kind of a balance of, of two things. And overall, you could see it as a trade-off of the dynamic effects for rights holders, uh, creating this incentive for production of new works, weighed against the negative static effect for consumers and the negative dynamic effects for producers that use works as an input. So in flexibility discussions, now we're getting to the point again, the touchstone should really be how does the value of flexibility for the users of material weigh up against the incentives for production and distribution of works for the original producers of those works. Now look at the, a number of examples we, we encountered in our study that may require or that may benefit from flexible copyright. Where do we need flexible copyright instead of just a system of exceptions and limitations. And we, we went through some, some case law and some well-known examples uh, for, from, from, from various sources, media, literature, lobby, articles, whatever. And this is like a short list that you can bear in mind if you want to talk about flexibility. Well, one is search engines, of course, that, that's obvious. Indexing, thumbnails, news, uh, that's something that is kind of not really at ease with the current copyright system, uh, at least not in, in, in Europe. User-generated content, another important one. Cloud computing, uh, text and data mining, e-learning, uh, transformative uses like in documentaries, um, online archives, orphan works. And then, maybe the most important category of all, the yet unknown application technologies that, that kind of 
are at odds with current copyright. And well, one example that, that's not unknown because I can tell you about it, of course, is detecting plagiarism, for instance. Software indexing material to, to detect plagiarism in, 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 in uh, uh, assessments and, and, and pro projects for, for, for students. Um, that's, again, something that has not, nothing to do with the actual publishing uh, distribution of works, but still uh, copies works and indexes them and puts them in databases for, for this purpose. Um, in the European perspective, you would find judges always to find, or often to find a way to kind of think of a trick, basically, to somehow apply an exception or a limitation and to allow such applications. So they have this sense of reality in many of their judgments, but from a legal perspective, that's not very satisfactory um, if they have to kind of find their way around uh, uh, the, the list of exceptions and limitations um, and, 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 and to come up with some, some trick to, to not ban search engines, for instance. Now, bearing those examples in mind, go back to the costs and benefits of flexibility. And first, I want to look at the rights holders' perspective. Um, license fees for many of these examples uh, can be seen, I think, as windfall profits for rights holders. For instance, their license fees for digital use where no license fee was required for the physical formats. So now, for, in a digital world, they suddenly earn a claim to, 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 to revenues that they didn't earn in, in an analog world or in, in, a, in a world of physical formats. Or there are license fees for material that has decayed uh, physically, like archives decaying and suddenly uh, uh, in a digitized world they, they, they earn revenues again, or that de decayed economically, that are kind of uh, out of commerce. Um, or license fees for types of use that have nothing to do with the initially intended use. And again, indexing for search engines or detecting plagiarisms could serve as examples there. Um, and I think it's important to realize that windfall profits give no, uh, give no uh, incentive. Sorry. So going back to the touchstone I, I, I formulated oops, um, for, for flexibility discussions, does it give incentives for the cr uh, production of, of future works? Well. If we're talking about true windfall profits, they don't give in incentives unless you kind of always expect windfall profits to occur. Say, okay, I create works but because somehow revenues will come from some unknown and unforeseen angle. Um, then from the use perspective, um, well, I think it's important to realize that saving out on license costs should not be the right motivation for introducing flexibility because then again you're just redistributing money from users to, or from, from rights holders to users because they're not paying any more for what they used to pay for. I think that's not the key issue in flexibility discussions because that's a serious game in economic terms. The real economic benefits lie in the new users of technologies that do not occur if we don't have, have, have um, flexibility, or in a reduction of transaction costs when way too many licenses have to be uh, agreed on uh, for certain users, or perhaps in a reduction of risks uh, because of, of, of legal uh, certainty that some users will be allowed relying on, on flexibility or fair use uh, defense. Um, and, and finally, there, there can be an economic argument that sometimes an anti-commons problem will occur if, a, for instance, a documentary maker has to negotiate license deals with many input uh, rights holders who all kind of um, optimize their monopoly revenue. That creates an anti-commons problem that eventually such a documentary may not be able to, 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 uh, uh, to be uh, uh, made because all rights holders are, are optimizing their own uh, revenues rather than optimizing the, 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 full, the full picture. So in such instances, the anti-commons problem may be resolved by uh, flexibility. Um, then on to empirical issues, and that's where we started to disappoint our client. Um, studies on the value of industries making use of fair use or exceptions and limitations are just as useful or less, whatever you want to cross, uh, as studies on the value of copyright dependent industries. You know, there's this, this industry of, of, of WIPO studies on the value of copyright based industries, and they account for like 8% of GDP and 10% of exports, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and there have been some studies, and actually I, I did one of them for Europe, on the reverse, so the economic value of industries depending on uh, copyright exceptions and limitations. And uh, lo and behold, they come up with more or less the same figures, and more interestingly, they come up with the same industries depending both on copyright and on exceptions and limitations. But make no mistake, 
you cannot extrapolate, extrapolate from, this, from those studies. You can't say, okay, we see that uh, this industry, uh, this, this country has strong copyright protection and has a higher percentage, so uh, if we double copyright, we double the out output of, of, uh, of, of this, these industries. Well, maybe it's, it's, it's a lever curve, right? Uh, if you have complete draconic protection, no one can create because anything you do will be protected and, and, and has to be licensed. So I don't think that's the way forward really to, 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 to make decisions about the value of more flexibility uh, um, instead of uh, a, a mere system of exceptions and limitations. And also the evidence for the chilling effects uh, of a system of only exceptions and limitations is thin and inconclusive in my opinion. Um, I, I, I quoted some, some reference there and um, they're, not, they're not solid enough, enough yet. But of course there's a methodological challenge in, the, in, the, in this research and that's the core reason why uh, uh, economists often have to, has to, have to disappoint uh, uh, policymakers here. I mean you can't interview a company that doesn't exist. So um, chilling effects are really hard empirically to, to kind of document uh, because your, your counterfactual is, 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 is problematic. Um, but what is something that we should and could improve is um, good ex ante and ex post evaluations of policy changes. And I think that's a mischance in, in Israel and Korea uh, where they moved to flexible copyright or more flexible copyright and they didn't do any ex ante studies and not even any ex post studies on the effect of those policy changes. And that's, I think it's really a mischance because the world could learn so much from that. Um, and then finally, Judges tend to find their way around, as I said, the rigid applications of, of exceptions and limitations and of copyright law. So in practice, um, the economic difference are not that big of having flexibility because judges will maneuver around it. To conclude, the value of flexibility for consumer and producers using works lie in, in lower license fees, but that's a zero-sum game. More importantly, in a reduction of transaction costs and a reduction of debt weight losses from sales or uses not taking place, uh, lacking flexibility, and in less uncertainty if certain uses are allowed. But that's a theoretical economic argument because in practice, um, these effects are hard to, to, to prove. The touching stone in these discussions, I think, should be how does this, these effects weigh up against the incentives for creation, creation and distribution of works? Are these revenues from these license fees windfall profits or reasonable expectations for rights holders? I think that is the key issue here. And then finally, the welfare effects are hard to determine in practice and there is a strong need for ex ante and ex post evaluations of any policy change in this field taking place. Thank you. Thank you, Joost. And our next speaker is Piotr Strzelski from the OECD. Does this mouse work? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Park. I'm Piotr Strzelski. I'm working at uh, Directorate for Science, Technology, Industry at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, in France. Um, this organization gathers 34 industrialized countries, uh, mostly EU countries, NAFTA, some Asia Pacific countries like Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand. Um, what we are doing is mostly we gather statistics as unbiased, as factual, as true as possible, and based on these statistics we try to formulate policy advice, which means that our work is mostly descriptive, it's not prescriptive. Um, it might be a bit trivial, but yet we believe it presents a kind of stock taking of what we know in this area. So um, when Professor Park asked me, yeah, it works, asked me actually uh, to present today, um, I was thinking which papers, which books that we produce could be of relevance for you. And um, there are three books of three re areas of research that are actually of relevance. Um, I've selected two, number one and number two. Number one is uh, the economic impact of counterfeiting and piracy. That's something that's been completed and even updated. Number two is uh, research on piracy of digital content, online piracy. That's a research where we completed just a half of it. We haven't completed actually the quantification part. 
reasons why we haven't done so well. I'll explain in due course. Uh, the third research that we will not touch upon is about copyright in the age of the Internet. It's something that's ongoing, um, and I'll also mention why I don't want to go into details in a second. Alors, piracy of copyrighted content, or infringements of copyrighted content. It's like the other side of the coin of copyrights. So we're looking at the black side, the dark side. And I believe that looking at dark side can tell us something about the measurement issues um, that are also relevant for the white side, for the, for the good, for the interesting things that are relevant for today's meeting and for the upcoming days. And actually, when we talk about infringement of copyrighted products, there are two ways of infringement that are quite different from the economic perspective, from the measurement perspective, and from the policy perspective. One is the infringement of tangible products, so CDs with fake music, or CDs with pirated music, DVDs with pirated movies. The other one is online piracy, internet piracy. These two things infringe the same copyright, the same right, but are economically totally different. So now, concerning, concerning the easy part, the, well, easy from a methodology perspective, the, the part on tangible products, well, CDs, DVDs, that can contain something that's copyright infringing. Um, we deal basically with classical economic goods where marginal costs of production are positive. You need to spend some money to produce a fake CD with, a, with pirated content. It's a classical commodity good that costs something, costs some cents, euro cents, whatever, euro or Japanese yens. And usually when you buy this, it's a commercial transaction. So you pay some euros or dollars to buy a CD with pirated music, which means that you have some proxy of value of this music based on this CD. It's also, another point, it's also legally certain. When you have pirated CDs, you're kind of certain that this is illegal. This is against the law. You're infringing copyright with a pirated DVD CD. So you're sure what you're dealing with. It means that methodology to produce any kind of measurement or statistical analysis about piracy of piracy with, that deals with tangible content is pretty easy when it comes to the you know, cooking process. Uh, as I said, at the OECD we are statisticians and we like dealing with all these needy, greedy components with data. So when it came to the issue how to measure piracy of tangible things, we were pretty happy. Just look at how many cities are there in the world, how many of them have fake or pirated content, what's the value, and voila, you're there. Sounds easy. Well, it sounds easy because there are problems with data. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here if it was so easy. Uh, why are there problems with data? Well, firstly, it's, it's illegal. And uh, since it's illegal, there is no data on illegal transactions. There's only proxies, estimates, guesstimates. We decided to focus on international trades because customs could provide us with some data on flows, trade with fake, with fake goods, including CDs and DVDs with uh, pirated content. So based on custom seizures and trade data that we took from ANCTA, from the United Nations, we produced some estimates of uh, trade flows with pirated content, with uh, pirated content in music, movies, software, well, according to HS categories. Um, it's a general number. It was updated in 2009. Uh, actually, it was pretty aggregated, and it wasn't copyright specific. It was just product specific, so I will not report here. The main message is that here, the methodology was pretty simple. The data was a problem. It's like if you're cooking, you have a recipe that looks trivial, but when it comes to ingredients, you realize that your fridge is empty. Well, it was a bit challenging, but now we come to a big problem that is more of focus of today's meeting, the online piracy. Here we have two problems. There is no methodology and the fridge is empty. Um, and the rest of my presentation will be just complaining why the methodology is difficult and why the fridge is empty. So firstly, if you look at economic properties of online products that could be possibly copyright protected, there is no marginal cost of publication. You just press Control c Control v and you are there. And a copy is perfectly the same as the original. There is no transport cost. Thanks to the beauty of the Internet, you can transfer quickly from Argentina to Zimbabwe within a millisecond. 
So the market for these goods is global. You cannot say we will check what's the size of piracy in one country. It's extremely difficult. It flows globally, so you should have a global look, which creates some additional data problems. Often, digital piracy is out of monetary environment. You don't pay to access infringing products. You get them for free. The only cost you get is economic cost of uncertainty, whether you get some viruses or some inconvenience cost with dealing with advanced software, but you don't pay actually money. And the final big problem for us was the so-called legal uncertainty, whether things that could be possibly considered digital piracy are actually digital piracy or not. Let me spend one more slide on this issue. Um, online piracy, what legal uncertainty, well, actually, what does it mean, digital piracy? These differences differ significantly across jurisdictions. In some jurisdictions, there's a difference between civil infringement or just you know, minor infringement and criminal infringement. Other jurisdictions don't have it and just have infringement in general. Many jurisdictions have exceptions and limitations to copyright that in the age of the internet result in lots of uncertainties. Consider such terms as friends. Uh, there is one country, my home country, Poland, where for a while uh, it was allowed to share copyrighted files with friends. And then you could have access to some internet fora, where by accessing the fora you join a group of friends. It was written in terms of reference. So theoretically, if you share copyrighted material with your friends on this internet forum, you don't infringe copyrights. And these fora, actually, they were just meant to to provide you with links to rapid share or other, other internet services where you could save um, copyright materials. That was amended, but this just shows that small exceptions can create a huge, huge um, legal, say, loop for possible, um, for possible piracy opportunities. Another term is distribution or possession. If you just download, you don't distribute. So in some jurisdictions, consumption of copyright, copyright Infringing material is de facto legal, or it's not illegal. Possession, if you're streaming, you're not possessing this. So it's legal to stream, it's legal to watch. And these small differences that appear to be really all over the place, there is no like, harmonized copyright system across the world, they create the gray zone between what is legal and what is illegal, extremely huge. And technology creates a kind of safe harbors Pirates tend to go to economies, to jurisdictions, where these um, exceptions create opportunities for them to thrive. Last but not least, we were talking here about just the books, how it looks from legal perspective. But clearly, these are regulations that not necessarily can, must be enforced. And often we see that regulations are not enforced. Here is one slide that explains why. And uh, at the OECD, we talk to people from various ministries and whenever we try to talk about copyrights, they are kind of bored. Why do we talk about music and movies? It's not a serious problem. It's not unemployment. It's not drug trafficking. It's, not, it's nothing big. It's just you know, fun. Why do you care? So um, de facto, uh, copyright enforcement has relatively low priority among public authorities, especially in those countries that appear to be these safe ha harbors, these safe havens, where copyright exceptions create opportunities for pirates to, to be located. And this altogether makes the point why the fridge is empty and there is no recipe. Uh, in order to measure copyright infringement, and actually copyright in general, um, several data issues should be addressed. First, on the copyright legislation level, it's extremely multidimensional. Uh, as you said, we can talk about strong and weak copyrights, but we can also deal with exceptions. We do not know yet how to measure this credibly so that at the country level we come up with a good index. Once we come up with a good index, legal index, we need to still deal with enforcement issues, whether these rules of law are properly enforced. Then when you go into copyright industries, well, we face the problem that some copyright goods are actually out of monetary environment. Uh, copyright intense industries might generate money out of other sources than just selling copyright products or licensing copyright products. 
to, um, to customers. There are many great models that are based on advertisements or concert or, or other things, but this kind of decouples sale of a product with money flow that is usually the basis for economic analysis, for appro approximation of value of a copyright product. Second, there is no firm level data on copyright intensity. We have lots of data on patents, and that's why there are so many great papers on patents, patent this, patents that. Unfortunately, copyright is not registered compulsorily. So um, we cannot measure how many copyrights are there in a given country, in a given firm, etc., etc. Three, many firms rely on, copyright, uh, on IP bundles. So copyright is not anymore a sole source of revenue. That applies mostly to software industry, where copyright is often mixed with patents. So when we talk about the copyright as a source of income, we should remember that it's not the only source of income. It's often linked with other IPs, such as trade secrets or patents. And lastly, uh, the beauty of internet economy really blurs the borders. So we should, when analyzing a single market, we should also take into account trade flows with copyright products across countries. That adds additional burden for that analysis. Look at trade in licenses, trade in products, actual products, measure consumption production, which makes sound, solid statistical analysis almost impossible at the general level, at least at such a boring organization as the OECD. And with this positive statement, I will take the liberty to finish. Um, my name is not among the easiest one, but oh, uh, you can always drop me a line or send me an email. I'll be more than happy to reply. And afterwards, I'll be more than happy to take some questions. Thank you. Merci. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, our uh, last speaker for this panel is Rokia Alavi, uh, Professor Alavi. Thank you. How do I handle this? Yes. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I've never done any work on copyright. My work has been always uh, uh, on patent. So I was thinking what is the best thing to do for this uh, presentation. So I thought uh, it would be an interest for all of you to, ha uh, to have an idea on Malaysian copyright flexibilities. So therefore, on my, uh, my, uh, my presentation today is on copyright flexibilities in Malaysia. Right. Uh, there are two uh, issues of concern uh, in relation to copyright flexibilities in Malaysia. First, first is uh, Malaysia has not taken uh, full advantage of many flexibilities available in the copyright uh, laws. One is uh, some of the limitations and exceptions uh, not incorporated in the Malaysian national copyright laws. Uh, this means uh, copyright owners are granted far more rights than they need to. Number two, uh, some cases, in some cases, even though there are some exceptions, uh, included in the national law, they have never been utilized. So that's the first issue. And number two is the TPPA or Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement. Free trade. It is a free, tra free trade agreement where the U.S. is pushing for higher copyright protection. And we believe that it will definitely narrow the flexibilities huh, in the copyright, uh, protection, uh, copyright law. So before I begin, I'd like to give you some uh, brief overview on Malaysia. Uh, sorry. Uh, basically, Malaysia is a plural, heterogeneous country. Uh, it got independence from Britain uh, in 1957. Basically, majority of the population is Malays or other Bumiputra. Bumiputra means peop uh, or the abori uh, not aborigines, the, um, the people who, the original people who live there. Uh, that's about 70%. Chinese, uh, about 25%. 
Indian, uh, 7%, and others about 0.7%. Majority, uh, religion-wise, 61% uh, of the population are Muslims. Uh, Buddhism and other Chinese religions, about 21%. Christianity, about 9%. And Hinduism is about 6.3%. Uh, basically, Malaysian economy has successfully transformed over the last 50 years. Uh, this, of course, we have some uh, social tensions at the moment. Uh, we have moved from a rubber and tin economy and has di diversified, industrialized, and undergone significant structural change. And it is uh, actually uh, now upper middle income country uh, targeting developed status by 2020. So that's where Malaysia is. Uh, in terms of population, it's about 30 million. Uh, GDP is about uh, GDP growth is about 4 percent. Inflation about 2 percent. Uh, per, uh, per, uh, per capita GDP income is about 10,000 uh, USD, and unemployment rate is about 3 percent. Um, mainly, we are producing manufacturing products. You can see, uh, of course, services is a key uh, component of the economy. 25 percent is manufacturing, and agriculture has gone down from 33 percent. Uh, to 7% eh, over the years, about the past 40, 50 years. Uh, okay, now I'm going to talk on the copyright laws. Actually, if, for an economist to talk about copyright laws is not easy, but I, I try my best. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, first, uh, copyright laws is first enacted in 1969. It's, uh, actually, we follow the British law. Um, and uh, the law that governs the copyright law now is uh, the, based on the 1987 Copyright Act. Uh, we are a member of a uh, Bern Convention. TRIPS Agreement, WIPO, and also w, uh, WPPT, WIPO Performance and Phonogram Treaty. Basically, we follow the TRIPS Agreement. Uh, you can see the category there, literary, literary works, uh, musical works, artistic work, films, uh, sound recording, and broadcast. Generally, basically, uh, the protection is life of the creator plus 50 years. Um, now I'm going to focus on four areas of limitation and exceptions. Uh, where Malaysia has actually not fully utilized these limitations and exceptions. First is the parallel import. Uh, Malaysia adopts uh, domestic exhaustions. It means that copyright owners have the right to control importation of the works. And parallel, therefore, the parallel importation of any copyrighted items is prohibited. Number two is compulsory licensing. Uh, the Bern Convention allows government to issue license for making translation and print. So works uh, that is uh, published in printed or analog form of, re of reproduction, uh, that is after three years of the, the first publication. And this is only for the purpose of teaching, scholarship, and research. But in Malaysian uh, copyright law, uh, it allows uh, compulsory licensing for translation work for to national language within one year after the first publication. However, this has never been utilized. Huh? This provision has never been utilized. And the third one is anti-competitive practices. Uh, TRIPS allow uh, the national legislation, le legislation to adopt appropriate measures to prevent or control licensing practices or conditions that may constitute an abuse of IP rights and have an adverse impact on competition in the relevant market. Uh, Malaysia has not uh, included in the, uh, this uh, provision in the uh, copyright law. And anti-circumvention, uh, the WCT requires members to provide uh, adequate legal protection and legal remedies against circumvention of effective technological protection measures that are used by authors in connection with the exercise of their rights. Malaysia actually has adopted this provision much earlier before it became a member. Mem we became the member only in December 2012. Okay, and a uh, little bit on the TPP. Um, TPP is a regional free trade agreement that is still being negotiated among 12 countries. Uh, these 12 countries are Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Mexico, Malaysia, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, U.S., and Vietnam. It is actually an ambitious and comprehensive FTA. It aims to liberalize almost all areas of goods and services and intends to go beyond the commitments uh, established in WTO. Now we are in the 19th round so far, and uh, it is expected to be uh, concluded by end of this year, which I don't think it will happen. Um, under TPPA, basically, U.S. has sought to increase IP protection. It's basically push, uh, U.S. is basically pushing for standard of protection similar to that found in the U.S. law. It go, uh, definitely goes beyond trips, WCT, and WPPT. And basically, it uh, want to add another 20 years plus to the protection term. And uh, also seeking for expansion in the national treatment obligation to full national treatment. 
and also to create new uh, types of rights that are not covered by existing copyright law and also reduce possibilities of limitation and exceptions and finally to also it wants to expand the obligation of the TPM, uh, Technological Protection Measures. Uh, at the moment, limited, as, you, as I've shown earlier, limitation and exception in Malaysian copyright law is very limited and uh, definitely the benefit has accrued to the copyright owners, mostly multinational uh, companies because Malaysia is actually a net importer of copyright products and services and exports and uh, production is very small and our tertiary education in the university we are highly dependent on imported books, journals, databases, software and also other educational materials and therefore we are, the ed tertiary education is the most affected by the narrow flexibilities and the impact is it limits access to knowledge, curtails creativity and productivity and slows down the economic growth. Um, a little bit on copyright uh, based industries, this is based on the WIPO study by Kanapati um, the growth uh, of the industry between 2000 and 2005 uh, is where the value, value added has grown quite uh, significantly, about 11%, surpassed the national economic growth of 6.6%. Uh, the contribution of GDP has increased from 4.7% to 5.8%, and employment in this sector also has grown uh, by 10.7%. And as a result of this, we can see that the, national, uh, the share of uh, copyright-based uh, industries in the national employment has uh, increased from 5.3% to 7.5%. Um, among the industries that are important in Malaysia, uh, that is copy, uh, that related to copyright, is one, uh, press and literature. Number two is software and databases. And three is motion and video. So these industries accounted for 88% of the value added and 91% of the total employment. Okay. Uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the publishing industry, basically this industry is relatively small and it mainly engaged in the publication of school book textbooks and related material because the schools use the uh, locally published books. Huh? That's about 70%. Uh, in 2004, um, the value of the publishing industries are only about half a, 500 million USD. In comparison, in the US, it's worth about 30 billion. And uh, in the university, it's common for people to copy uh, because books are expensive, so it's quite common to f find people to photocopy. And you can see photocopying shops, small shops uh, around the university. Uh, awareness definitely is very low. Uh, to overcome this, Malaysia has actually established a center which is called as Copyright Control Center where it's a, actually uh, this uh, center is given, uh, will uh, issue license uh, for anybody who wants to print uh, any copyrighted work. But of course this is not successful because lack of uh, awareness mainly. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, books, academic books in the university, uh, especially in the university, are mainly imported. We use imported books, about 60%. Uh, in 2007, about 50% uh, of these books come from U.S., 70% from U.K., Taiwan 8%, China 8%, and Hong Kong 4%. Uh, and the worst part is uh, it is controlled by the agent uh, because people cannot freely import from overseas uh, because of the control on the parallel importation. Uh, uh, most of the books are distributed through the headquarters in Singapore and Hong Kong. And... Um, so basically, uh, an another important thing is that the pro foreign publisher uh, do not grant license huh, to publish local reprints and edition in Malaysia. So it makes books more expensive. The reason why they don't give license or reprint printing is because the market is small. So as a result of this, um, uh, supply is limited and definitely cost is extremely high uh, in relation, in re relative to the uh, income. Huh? And in terms of motion pictures and video, uh, local film industry consists of largely Malay movies, local movies uh, for domestic market. Malaysian market is multilingual. High number of uh, movies are actually imported. In 2007, uh, about 9,000 films, films including documentary and all this, uh, are actually imported. And uh, about 70% come from US uh, and 11% in terms of total collections of from films. Uh, and 11% Malay movies, 10% um, Chinese, and 5% Indian movies. Piracy definitely is very high. It's about 60%. Uh, and, but it's declining uh, because of the improved DVD technology. Cable TV, uh, is, there's only one. It's Monopoly, uh, owned by um, one, one company. And it's very expensive, and programs are very limited. 
In terms of software and databases, uh, it is actually a very fast-growing uh, sector. A lot of locals are involved in this, uh, basically uh, involved in the original local content development in the area of education, entertainment, com commerce, and industrial activity. They produce for local market and also for export market. Uh, software market is about 1 billion USD. Uh, it's, uh, most of the license are actually imported through, uh, through license agent, and therefore it's extremely expensive. An online database in library acqui uh, acquired through licensing agreement, again, it's high cost, and therefore at the university we don't have access to many uh, important references because of the cost. Uh, so the libraries therefore select only those, uh, you know, databases, databases that are highly demanded, and usually they will discontinue subscri subscription of print version of journals, which is very important as a reference. Uh, software piracy is high. So, um, so uh, with that, I would like to conclude by saying that, uh, you know, there are many, uh, not many studies, there, but some studies have shown that weakening of the flexibilities in the copyright laws leads to static and dynamic uh, inefficiencies and reduction in the economic welfare, as has been discussed earlier by the two, first two speakers. Uh, in Malaysia, because of the lack of awareness on the importance of these flexibilities, uh, sorry, there's a lack of awareness uh, on the importance of these flexibilities in Malaysia, not only among the public, but also among the uh, policy makers. And this is clearly reflected in the debates and discussion on the possible impacts, because only this year I can see that people are actually discussing on the impact of IP on, in the, on, on, the, on, on the public, uh, and uh, because of the TPPA, okay? And, First time I've seen that this kind of discussion has actually come, uh, is widely discussed. But uh, the discussion has been only on the uh, patents and access to medicine. And I've not seen any discussion on copyright. Uh, mainly that's because of uh, lack of awareness. Huh? Um, and finally, uh, there's, therefore, there's a need to undertake, rese undertake research on copyright flexibilities. Uh, so far, uh, there's no economic analysis on this uh, has been done in Malaysia. Okay. With that, I'd like to thank. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, this is what we'll do. Um, we'll invite people to uh, ask questions. If you could, uh, for the purposes of our uh, webcast audience, come and use the speakers up front. Uh, that would be nice. And if, if you can, identify yourself so we get to know you. Uh, so, uh, for a long, long time, and we do things internationally. And I've always had the reason I was interested in coming here, and it's kind of in all the panels, but the, the last one, is there any enforcement mechanism with this TPPA? Uh, because that's always the problem of how do you, when they take something from our clients, and it's particularly overseas, if it's not in Western Europe or America or Canada, you know, we, we're kind of like, you know, up the river without a paddle. And so is there any enforcement mechanism either planned or already, uh, that already exists? Uh, enforcement uh, related to copyright, is it? Yes. Uh, there are copyright, trade infringement, the whole intellectual property package. Yeah. It's part of the negotiation, how to, uh, to enhance uh, co uh, IP protection. Yeah, but does I it exist? I mean, is there a form? I spent a lot of time eight, ten years ago, trying to develop some type of NAFTA court. And there was all these meetings with Canadians and Mexicans, and in the bottom line, nothing happened. My question is, is there any forum or any plan for a forum where someone who finds a breach of copyright or trademark infringement can go and actually um, resolve whatever the matter happens to be? Okay. Um. Well, what, what I thought what might be a, a little bit more efficient uh, is to collect questions first, and then we'll turn to the audience. So I think we have another gentleman. Would you like to use a speaker? So uh, please. Uh. Good afternoon. My name is Morad Ekbal, uh, previously at the University of Baltimore Center for International and Comparative Law, now with uh, Plasmera Technologies, LLC. Uh, as just a general question, will the PowerPoint slides be available on the website for us to utilize, or are they all proprietary and no. protected? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, Thank you for that answer. Uh, the, the question I have is, is actually really a twofold question, if I may, and that is that 
I seem to detect a presupposition in the entire presentation that all of the copyrights are either being held by individuals or by corporations. I mean, uh, is, is that a correct perception? Because if there isn't, then the business of life plus 50 years in the context of a corporation really doesn't make sense. A corporation could be existing for 100 years plus 50 or it could be in perpetuity. So I'd like the panelists to speak to that, not necessarily from a legal standpoint, but what the economic component is as to a differentiation between an individually held copyright versus a company held copyright. And then the second question I have related to that, and it relates to the, what the gentleman just asked, uh, might it not make more sense from the standpoint of developing a kind of a global regime as has been discussed by the panelists, to focus on harmonizing the remedies for breach, not unlike a NAFTA regime, but it's not a good analogy because there are lots of issues with the NAFTA regime, but something different where we can actually get a definitive response that helps with remedies in case of breach from an economic standpoint. I don't want to get into the legal because that's the second panel. I want to see whether there is an economically compelling reason to say, yeah, we really should be focusing on developing economic remedies before we get to harmonizing everybody else. So it's a spoke of the wheel, different spokes. Everybody can have a different regime, but they all end up on the center of the remedies. Thank you for considering my question. Thank you. And uh, a third question. Yes, uh, Martin Senfleben from the Free University Amsterdam. Um, it is my understanding that this meeting is particularly on copyright flexibilities. So I'm wondering if our colleague from the OECD could add some further information on a paper that I personally found very interesting in that area, which was called uh, Participative Web, uh, User-Generated Content. I think an OECD study of uh, a couple of years ago, 2007 or 8. Um, so I would be particularly interested in the methodology used for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so why don't we uh, turn to our panel. Uh, Professor Alavi, would you like to address the uh, first question? Um, okay, um, for the enforcement, uh, we, I'm referring to the relation case, yeah? Uh, we have actually now IP court. Uh, it's just established in 2008. So all, all the, um, you know, all the infringement of IP is actually now brought to the IP court, which is, uh, you know, as a significant improvement in the IP enforcement. Hmm? Where does it say? Where is this court? Where does it exist? Where? I mean, you can ask him later. Where, where does this court? Is talking about only in Malaysia, or is it someplace, does the court sit someplace? Oh, I, I really don't know about the copyright from the legal perspective. I'm sorry, I mean, yeah. I know in Malaysia we have IP court, uh, but internationally, I, anybody can help. I, I really don't uh, know about the you know, legal perspective of this enforcement. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, to, I don't to know. be pursued. <laughs> if you ask about Malaysia, I, I know a little bit from the legal perspective. Otherwise, I'm sorry. I, I okay. So then there is this question about corporations versus individuals and also economic remedies. If, uh, uh, Anyone would like to address that? Or? Well, I think it's primarily a legal question, really, how you define uh, this life issue if, if, if copyright rests with the organizations. But I can say that there's no academic, economic research whatsoever that proves that such a long term would be efficient in terms of dynamic effects on creation of works. Um, and I know that, I mean, in many areas, uh, the copyright is defined, even if it's transferred to a corporation, with the life of the original author. But I, for, for, for group works, that, that is probably different. I don't know the finances of that. But um, um, for, for, for individually created works like books and songs, um, even if the uh, right is transferred to a, to a, a corporation, um, the life of the physical uh, writer of the work uh, of the work is uh, uh, is definitive. Okay. Yeah, sure. I think there was also a, a duration aspect in that question. Um, the duration of copyright and the extension of copyright duration have been, as you might know, um, uh, very contentious. Also amongst economists, um, the um, some people like Arkelov and a couple of other famous uh, economists got in there and they argued that it would re it's ridiculous to retroactively, um, from an economic perspective, doesn't sound like a good idea to retroactively extend. 
I would be a bit more cautious about this. Um, for example, because um, the very corporations that get a windfall benefit for something they created in the past anyway, um, that is now perhaps worth more because copyright lasts longer, um, they might reinvest, right? So um, that's an, an, an added dimension. Um, there's also lots of indication that copyright duration is really rather long indeed. And um, I can't give you a firm answer um, on, um, on the economic evidence in this respect. The extreme positions are also clear. Some people say there should be perpetual copyright, but with an obligation to, um, to um, renew claims after a shorter period of time than we have now, perhaps against some kind of modest payment, just to make sure that we don't uh, we don't have too much out of the public domain that, that no one is interested in commercializing anymore in that, you know, as, a, as the um, um, copyright holder. And then the other position would be to make it a lot shorter. Initially, I think it was 14 years in the statutes of N, and many people argue that uh, shorter copyright duration would be now, again, better for the technological environment that we do have. That's a rough description of what I've read other people argue about this. Harmonization of remedies, I think, is a super interesting topic, but I think there's, I'm not aware of any international project on the matter. On the national level, some levy kind of systems and so on, I think, are pretty similar to what you were describing. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, just, just one addition to that. If, you, if you're talking about remedies against uh, infringement, like enforcement measures, I think we're still in the middle of finding out what really works and what doesn't. So in this stage, I'd say let flowers grow if you want to have them grow at all. Um, and, and let countries find out. And France, I think, has just found out that the uh, uh, three strikes legislation wasn't really uh, the, the great solution. And I think we need some more time of, of, of trial and error on that respect, what works and what doesn't work, before we could harmonize. Otherwise, you would end up harmonizing to us the wrong thing, perhaps. Okay, let's answer the third question before we get to the next question. So, up here. Uh, let me just add on the issue on harmonization of remedies. Um, I fully agree that first we need to know uh, which solution works before we kind of promote implementation of the solution at the global level. Here the issue would be actually also in developing a mechanism to assess these remedies, a mechanism that would be accepted generally by all the countries. And it's trivial to say that international negotiations that involve all the countries, not only OECD countries, but all the countries are extremely long and, uh, well, Negotiations take lots of time. An example could be negotiations with WIPO about exceptions of copyright with respect to accessibility issues for, I guess, vision impaired people. It's a, it's a small thing, and it takes ages to, to conclude uh, on this. So harmonization of remedies, I can imagine, that would be a major project that would take years. Um, concerning the question on, um, on paper and particip participative web, I think, thank you so much for recalling it. It's a pleasure when someone actually notices our research. Uh, actually, this, this paper took a different perspective on participative web. It took business model perspective. We tried to present what actually, what is this phenomenon in 2007. So a, a bit long ago, it's an old paper already. We tried to illustrate existing business models, monetization issues, and role of technology. And we tried to measure it, to relate uh, this new business models with, uh, hey, for example, high-speed internet or um, accessible internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, concerning the copyright issue in this context, we recognize it. However, due to measurement issues and due to other issues that are mostly of political nature, we haven't decided to go into it, to go too deep into it, in order to avoid too superficial message that could be just misinterpreted. Um, uh, please. Thanks. My name is Austin Svandiari. I'm with Telespheres. And I appreciate uh, the thoughts that you've all shared in the analysis. Um, I'd like you to take, a, if you can, uh, a virtual telescope or binoculars and try and look towards the future. Um, as we know in life, there's always this pendulum that swings from one side to the other. And from your presentations, I get the sense that the pendulum from your analysis is swinging against the benefit of copyright IP um, and greater ways or benefits from benefiting with marginalizing the IP portion. My question with a, with a long lens, looking forward in time, 
Is it possible with the pendulum swinging back and forth that you might have at some point a new paradigm? For example, as we see in the United States, there's privatization of government services. Would it be possible that copyright holders might end up going to a private regime, uh, some company like today's Google or Microsoft, to say we will enforce uh, copyright on a global basis? Uh, could it ever come to that uh, economically? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, another question, then we'll combine. Yes. Uh, Rebecca Giblin from Monash University. Uh, my question probably is uh, largely for Piotr, but maybe the other panelists have some insights as well. You know, we, we really emphasize, uh, empathize with you, I think, about the challenges associated with measuring the impact of digital infringement. But I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about the methodologies you have in mind for overcoming those in the studies that you're doing in the future, or if the others have any insights in it. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay, one more, Jeremy De Beer. Jeremy De Beer, University of Ottawa. Just a direct follow-up on that. In talking about the methodologies, could you talk about the difficulty presented by this duality that I think only you alluded to, used, which is that uh, the same industries are both uh, protected by copyright and benefit from the limitations and exceptions. So when you do these macroeconomic analyses, you get the same contributions to GDP. Uh, and so I wonder if you could talk about the difficulty, methodological difficulty, in that sort of um, duality or uh, schizophrenia between uh, a, a user and a, and a copyright holder. Okay, thank you. Um, so if someone could address the, the first question about um, the pendulum where it's going. Well, well let me give okay. a crack. I'm, I wish I knew the future. Then I would just pick the six right numbers in the upcoming lottery drawing. <laughs> but uh, considering the future of copyright, well, uh, anything that comes to my mind can happen. But there are two aspects that I would like to draw attention on. Actually, um, copyright in the age of the Internet tends to be associated with Internet as something that is given and will be developed in the future. Um, recent negotiations that were also on the ITU show that it may not necessarily be the case. Internet, the future of Internet is uncertain. And if the future of the Internet is uncertain, it's also likely that thing that we call today copyright might change and might call for further amendments um, if global web becomes something new. Another thing that really copyright might rely on is global payments. Um, for the moment, one of the big obstacles for development of new business models that, took advantage, that could take advantage of the Internet is lack of global payment scheme or there's fixed costs related to copy, uh, credit card possession or payments with different currencies. If this becomes solved, then one big bottleneck for a global copyright system is clear, and then perhaps market forces could promote establishment of new business models that we cannot even imagine right now. There was a question about the methodology uh, here um, that we have used. Is it about the upcoming methodology in the project? On well, um, this project hasn't been approved yet by our member countries, so I'll, actually I would like to uh, postpone this into a coffee break. I'll be happy to discuss you in a bilaterally, but I don't think I have a mandate to talk about this issue that wasn't actually cleared by member countries for the moment. Okay. Christian? Um, may I have a word on the um, private services of enforcement? Actually, I remember, or at least when I go back to the literature written before my time in the 90s and early millennium, around the millennium, many people were actually worried that private technical protection measures um, would overshoot and do away with the exceptions and limitations and what was considered to be a reasonable balance between uh, copyright enforcement and some, uh, well, exceptions and limitations. Um, at the current point in time, um, private enforcement has pretty much failed. And I think that raises an important question that not many people are you know, incorporating or at least expressing clearly that what rights holders are doing is saying, well, um, it's not efficient for us to do it ourselves. Which raises, of course, the question, first of all, why should governments be better at that? 
right? Uh, why should they be more productive regarding the enforcement? There might be good reasons for that. After all, they have the executive. Nevertheless, the next question is, if we rely more on public enforcement, which I think is, is something that we see a trend towards, or which is at least considered, if we go more towards public enforcement, um, how would governments know the right amount of enforcement? Right? We think about trade-offs all the time in economics. And there will be decreasing, uh, decreasing um, util marginal utility of investments in enforcement. And that is a really tricky question regarding um, public enforcement that I think is often glossed over. Um, so that's my uh, reaction to that. We might very well return to the initial question that people have, have raised is a private enforcement going to do away with copyright law and all the fine, intricate balances that it's supposedly developed over the 20th century? Yeah, in response to, uh, to Jeremy's question about duality or, uh, if you like, schizophrenia, um, well, I think the point is really made by performing those studies on, on the industries uh, relying on exceptions and limitations. Um, you, it's, it's very easy to abuse the outcome of such studies. I think they serve a purpose to analyze, uh, as you, you pointed out about Malaysia, in what way an economy has, has kind of uh, transformed into an information-based or services-based economy. And comparing those numbers, if you do them, the studies on the same basis in all countries, and that's what WIPO is striving for, serves a purpose in comparing and understanding uh, economies and, 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 and pointing the way economies might want to move. They don't point anywhere uh, in the debate if limitations, exceptions, flexibility should be stricter, more lenient, whatever. And I think that point is made by, by, by pointing out this, this schizophrenia. And even on a micro level, uh, I think it's, it, it may be interesting to say that we, we did a, a large survey amongst creators and performers in the Netherlands, and one of the questions we asked them was if they would download from illegal sources themselves. Um, and I mean, they were in their income dependent on, on copyright to a large extent, but I think about 30% admitted to downloading from legal sources themselves, which is slightly lower at the time uh, than the percentage over the general population in the Netherlands doing so, but still quite high, and even, I mean, correcting for the fact that they were admitting to it. And quite a large majority of them actually said, yes, I download from legal sources, and I think that more strict enforcement should be there on downloading from legal sources. So, talking about schizophrenia. Um, <laughs> But I think the point that, that should be, of the lesson that should be learned from, from that point is that they're actively, very actively using other works as an input, or at least that's the positive lesson I can draw. Um, so they're relying on copyright, yes, but they're also highly dependent on being able to access information, to access other works and build on them. I think uh, from developing countries perspective, uh, most of the countries are actually copyright users. They are not developers. They are not copyright owners. And therefore, the flexibility, the limitation and the flexibility are very important for the future development. You know, without that, uh, it's very difficult to move. Uh, similar to Peyton, we can see, I mean, I, my work, work has been consistent, and it's obviously it has been shown that with a stronger patent protection, it has actually impeded uh, growth in many developing countries, including Malaysia. Uh, from copyright, it's also the same. Uh, limitation and flexibilities are very important for future development. Uh, weakening that, I mean, Malaysia is very, it's very sad uh, that the, the policymakers have not seen this. Uh, they have not really used the limitation and flexibilities. So, uh, and we, uh, uh, copyright, yes, I, mean, I don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, basically, we are using copyright, so it's very important. Okay, uh, no more questions? Okay, then uh, let's take a short 10-minute uh, ten, ten break, and don't forget there's a round table coming up, so please stand by. <laughs> Thank you.
Only contest. Yeah, well, I can. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I think we have a project. Have some control. I that's for the framework that we have to every two years. And these are like five or six papers that we need to develop. Yeah, more like something smaller Yeah, yeah. Now we need to come for case picture, you know? That's prescriptive or descriptive. Part of the situation. Legislation. We are looking for various methods, but one of the conferences on the line of the which might be unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> That's class. This is what we learn in central parts.
Yes, Oops, uh oh. You want a hand or you got it? So on um, the website, Hedge of Impact, there will be places that can also be found. But write it down. My email address, and you can sign up by the end of the week. You can I want to get advice from
greatest little like speaker party favor I've ever seen. That's fantastic. That's totally useful. <laughs> they should do that in uh, Amsterdam where you really eat. <laughs> We're going to reconvene if people can start to take their seats, please. If I can have the speakers rejoin us. Yeah. Alan, that would be you. <laughs> we need you. <laughs> We would just All right, welcome back. Um, so I'm Michael Carroll. I'm the director of the program on information justice and intellectual property. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here in the room and on the web. Um, and so uh, that was a rich presentation of the um, empirical framework by which copyright limitations and exceptions are, are and are not being measured. Um, and now we're going to ask the lawyers uh, in a roundtable format to do two things, to um, respond to some of what we heard from the, the, the uh, uh, economists, but also to talk to us a little bit about um, what the current situation is in, in uh, various parts of the world regarding copyright limitations and exceptions. Um, one of the reasons for this meeting is a number of countries are revising their copyright laws, and in that process, um, the topic of limitations and exceptions has come up in part because many legal systems have a very set or closed list of uses that are permitted without the copyright owner's permission. And um, that list often is, lacks the flexibility to adapt to changes in technology. So whether the ability to scrape a news headline off of a news site and aggregate that is a permitted use or not is an issue that gets treated differently under different legal systems. Um, and there are some view, who view the economic effects of that as being relatively negligible and ought to be a permitted use, but because it's not on the list, it is treated as a source of liability. So examples like that put pressure on the existing laws to adapt. And one of the, so we're in the middle of legislative debates around the world. And one of the questions that arises over and over in those debates is, what, are the, what is the evidence? What is the evidence that's relevant to why we need uh, new limitations and exceptions to open up innovation, open up the possibilities of investments in these kinds of uses compared to the costs and harms to right, rights holders if these uses are permitted without remuneration or without um, a copyright owner control? So we have a, a star-studded panel here, and I'll just quickly introduce them. Then I'll ask each person to give us about four or five minutes of uh, preliminary thoughts, of, both in reaction. And then I have a few questions that we can kind of go back and forth. So let's see if, I'm, if we're lined up. We are. All right. This is great. To my immediate right, Jeremy De Beer uh, it, it comes to us from the University of Ottawa in Canada and also teaches a summer class here at WCL on the relationship between intellectual property and sustainable development. And next to him is Rebecca Giblin from the Monash University in Australia, although presently resident in California at Berkeley. Um, uh, Carolyn Nube from the University of uh, Cape Town in South Africa is probably our most distant traveler this time, and uh, we're very uh, glad she's here. Alberto Cerda is a PhD candidate at Georgetown University and also a professor at the Universidad de Chile. Um, 
Martin Sintleben from the uh, University of Amsterdam uh, is with us. Um, and then Jennifer Urban is also at UC Berkeley Law School. Uh, finally, we have Alan Rocha, or not finally, well, finally in this case, because Alan Rocha comes to us from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And our last panelist, Pranesh uh, Prakash, is, has been delayed in transit. There's a possibility he'll join us at some point in the afternoon, but uh, I think we'll, we'll be missing him. He works with Sunil, our keynote, so we will at least get some of the Indian perspective um, in this conversation, if not from Pranesh right now. So with that, let me just uh, open the floor and each of you give us some reactions. But, but I would ask, since we know that we are in a legislative debate about copyright reform, if you could reflect on and talk about the ways in which empirical evidence, economic evidence, economic effect gets used in the legislative debate and what might be done out of a project like this to improve the quality of the evidence that would be treated as relevant evidence and important evidence by policymakers and lawyers in the legal system. So take it away. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, I'd like to actually t uh, take a bit of a broader approach to your um, interest in legislative debates because what we've seen in Canada since the turn of the century is a very complex and nonlinear relationship between court decisions, uh, legislative policy, academic scholarship, and advocacy activities, and they're fundamentally intertwined. Uh, in 2012, Canada passed the Copyright Modernization Act, which was a very long time, more than a decade in the making. And we see in the Copyright, Copyright Modernization Act an emphasis on the principle of balance. Um, and that emphasis on the balance between copyrights and users' rights is entrenched in the legislation because of what the Supreme Court of Canada had done uh, in, a, in a series of cases the decade before the legislation was enacted. So actually, I'll just take you back very briefly to the start of the 21st century and a book published by uh, David Vaver, who's a law professor who's taught in Canada and New Zealand and Oxford. And he wrote a book uh, called Copyright Law in Canada. And he had an entire chapter in that book called Users' Rights. And the foreword to that book was written by the Chief Justice of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin. And it was only four years after the publication of David Vaver's book with a chapter called Users' Rights that in a case called CCH in the Law Society of Upper Canada, the Chief Justice wrote in her decision that, quote, user rights are not just loopholes. And that was a real turning point in Canadian uh, policy toward copyright limitations and exceptions. And we see that coming directly from the academic scholarship. Now, it wasn't economic scholarship, it was legal scholarship, but the, there's a real opportunity for economics to inform uh, court decisions and, and jurisprudence, and that will in turn inform uh, legislative policy. If you look at some of the other cases that were decided around the same time, there's actually a series of three cases between 2002 and 2004 known as the Supreme Court of Canada's Copyright Trilogy. And one of those, uh, the cornerstone of that trilogy, I think, is the CCH case where it was unequivocally stated that copyright uh, user rights, limitations and exceptions are not just loopholes. Uh, another is the case of um, uh, Taberge where the court was very clear about the economic uh, issues before, uh, before it. And it, it said that it would be, it said in crassly economic terms, it would be as inefficient to overcompensate rights holders as it would be self-defeating to undercompensate them. But it didn't go into any more detail about how the court might strike that balance between over or under compensation. If you fast forward to 2012, um, it was a, another big year in, in Canadian jurisprudence. In addition to the, the statutory reforms in the Copyright Modernization Act, we have five Supreme Court of Canada cases known as uh, the Quintet or the Pentology. And two of these cases directly concern the interpretation of fair dealing. And in that context, we saw the court place heavy reliance on economic evidence, or in these particular cases, the absence of economic evidence. One of the cases uh, concerned the, the uh, fair dealing in schools and whether photocopying short excerpts of case books or textbooks and circulating those to students was a fair dealing or not. 
And the copyright collective that was arguing this was not fair dealing cited the fact that textbook sales had declined 20, uh, uh, by a significant percentage in the past 20 years, but didn't provide any evidence to back that up. And the Supreme Court rejected the argument that that was sufficient to say it wasn't fair dealing. They, were, um, they didn't call for uh, specific evidence to support the fairness of the dealing, but what's going to happen now is um, rights holders are, are, are sure to submit better evidence. The court has basically given them a, a road map to demonstrate adverse economic impacts in order to defeat an argument of fair dealing to narrow the scope of users' rights. And so I think there's actually a real opportunity for uh, independent uh, scholars and independent researchers to help provide evidence not to suggest that, um, that users' rights uh, don't have an adverse economic impact on rights holders. That, that may be the case, and the Supreme Court's already accepted that in the Alberta and Access Copyright case, but rather to demonstrate the positive impacts that user rights may have. And I think that's where a real opportunity lies. And if we can do that and get uh, the courts to start accepting this, we'll see a, a, a loop where judicial policy and legislative policy are intertwined with each other. Thank you. Rebecca? And please speak into the mics, guys, because we're on the web. So I'm here because finally something is happening in copyright in Australia. Uh, we have got an inquiry. The Australian Law Reform Commission was asked to inquire into the adequacy and the appropriateness of the existing exceptions and statutory licenses that we've got in the Australian copyright law. Uh, there have been almost 900 submissions so far in response to this. It's, the final report's going to be due in November, but 868 submissions as of Monday arguing the pros and cons of introducing, largely focusing on introducing more flexible exceptions, but also how do we deal with uh, user rights when it comes to education, people with disability, and across the entire spectrum. Um, the, uh, the Law Reform Commission indicated at the most recent uh, stage that it was inclined to introduce broader exceptions. It was inclined to reduce the possibility of contracting out of those exceptions. And it was also uh, very much inclined to introduce a flexible exception like US style fair use. And there's been a lot of pushback against that by right holders who have been arguing it will be too uncertain, that it will be contrary to Australia's international obligations under the three-step test. Uh, and that it means less works will be created. So I'm here today in my capacity as an academic, but I'm also a board director for the Australian Digital Alliance, which is a coalition of uh, innovators and users uh, who seek to advocate for uh, the development of law that's in the public interest, so balanced copyright law. So uh, my views are informed by that as well. Now in terms of the formal evidence that's been provided in all of these submissions, uh, I want to focus not just on the economic evidence, but also kind of the lack of economic evidence, the other kinds of evidence that are being put forward, because really there's very little economic evidence that's been used to support the arguments either for or against flexible exceptions. Uh, the, the main study that's been done in, in Australia uh, was by Lateral Economics that Joost uh, referred to that was commissioned by the ADA to try and um, quantify in a useful way the value of flexible exceptions. And uh, they came to uh, the view that uh, it would add about up to $600 million per annum to the, in productivity gains uh, if we did introduce flexible exceptions. And those reports were at least helpful in opening the eyes of policymakers and regulators to the possibility that maybe people advocating for flexible exceptions weren't just trying to free ride on the works of others, but maybe there was more to it than that. Um, but the other evidence tended not to be uh, so focused on economic evidence. It was largely focused on like the, the practical ridiculousness of the current law in many cases. So lots of real life examples of the things that you can't do under Australian law uh, that you really should be able to do. So for example, if you're a library, you can make quite extensive scans of, of print works for disabled users, but you have to destroy it after each single time. So even if you know that someone else is going to need it next week, you've got to destroy it and then you've got to scan it again for them. So there's a lot of real inefficiencies, a lot of high transaction costs for the, the institutions that are least able to bear them. 
Um, so providing a lot of these real life examples, you know, letting people know the fact that if you forward an email, that's a copyright infringement, things like that uh, were quite helpful. Uh, when it came to the evidence against fair use, I think what got the most widespread attention were the submissions from the Kernikan Center at Columbia Law School, which I'm sure some of you in this room uh, have read. And that submission referred to a lot of uh, US treatises and cases to support the idea that uh, fair use is inherently uncertain. Now, the, the submissions in favor of fair use referred to a lot of work by US scholars, Yazi, uh, Samuelson, Beebe, SAG, uh, which got a lot of traction within the ALRC. The Kernikan submissions tried to counteract that and suggested that the ALRC had put too much weight on those submissions. Um, and it, it really emphasized uh, those fair use guidelines that had been negotiated in the 70s and 80s by right holders. Um, there has been a response to this um, by Yazi, Hins, and SAG that's been circulated, but I suspect that the Kernikan submission has been circulated much more widely uh, than that. What's really notable is um, there really was no empirical economic evidence supplied in support of this argument that less works would be made if flexible exceptions were introduced. And that's not going to be a surprise to you after listening to Christian's presentation, which really suggested, well, maybe that's because there isn't any. Um, so what more evidence is needed? In terms of the, the further economic evidence that would be really helpful, we would benefit from uh, stronger evidence linking flexible exceptions to economic growth, of course. Um, studies considering whether flexible exceptions help or hinder different kinds of creators and in different circumstances. The extent to which purpose-based exceptions might generate those wasteful transaction costs, uh, if we could quantify those and measure those, it could be really useful. Um, and of course, Joost is right that you can't interview companies that don't exist, um, but maybe we could look at companies that go to innovation hubs like Silicon Valley from other jurisdictions, other countries, and try and measure the extent to which the lack of flexible exceptions influenced them um, in, in making those choices. So I know in Australia, if you, if you uh, are an innovator doing a tech startup, the first thing you do is fly to San Francisco. Um, so yeah, so uh, that's, that's really what I wanted to say. Um, I, I think one of the big problems though is part of the Australian process is that we've got some evidence, we've got uh, lots, of, uh, lots of illustrations about why uh, the Australian system is ridiculous. I mean, an Australian library is allowed to copy a work to, to, uh, to get a replacement copy after it's been lost or stolen but not until after it's been lost or stolen. <laughs> um, so we've, look, we've got evidence about the ridiculousness of the law. Uh, the trouble we are having is really getting the message out, getting people to care, getting them to understand that this is something that they should be uh, um, lobbying their politicians about. Thanks. Thank you. Carol. All right, listening to Jeremy and Rebecca, I'm quite envious because South Africa is in a very different position. So just to think about the Canadian situation, first of all, where there's a lot of case law and jurisprudence on this, um, South Africa is sadly lacking. Um, there are no cases at all on exceptions and limitations. So the courts do not even have the opportunity to engage with economic empirical research. And then moving along to Rebecca's account of what's going on in Australia where they've got um, a copyright reform process in motion and you've had almost 900 um, submissions. Well, we are kilometers behind. Um, South Africa has just published a draft um, national IP policy. It's not copyright specific. It covers all aspects of IP. Um, it does speak about copyright, but in a very superficial manner. So it makes the right noises about the need to have meaningful exceptions and limitations. Um, it doesn't say too much. Um, it cites no economic evidence whatsoever. And really, this is important because this is where we are. There hasn't yet been um, meaningful discourse. So what the government has done is put down what its position is and almost just throw the government open to everybody else to, to comment. So it's quite disappointing that um, there's very little economic empirical evidence that has been relied on by the relevant government department. Um, they do cite one paper entitled um, Copyright um, Exceptions, Limitations, and Learning Materials. Um, that leads to one of my major gripes. Um, this document is not publicly available. That means that anyone who wants to engage with that evidence 
is, is on a back foot. You, you can't interrogate evidence that you haven't seen. So I suppose um, the one thing I would like to say about South Africa is um, the very limited economic empirical research that is cited should be made publicly available. Um, in searching for um, that particular paper that is cited, which I could not find, I found another paper um, written by the same author, um, Professor Porris um, from the University of Pretoria, and this is one of those papers that you spoke about, those papers that talk about the economic contribution of copyright-based industries, right? So South Africa's done one of those studies. Um, we've already heard earlier on today that that's not particularly useful. Um, but still, I think it should have been put there at least in the policy so we know where to start from. Um, beyond that, there's been no other economic study of um, copyright that I know of in South Africa. There was a study carried out two years ago. Um, a WIPO publication came out of that. It's called The Economics of IP in South Africa. Um, it does not address, address copyright at all um, in any meaningful fashion. And so really I suppose the takeaway from me is that we obviously need some economic empirical research done in South Africa. Um, once that's available, that needs to be widely disseminated and then we can start to engage um, with the merits or demerits of what it says. Um, essentially, for now, that's my first bill. I'm hoping to get a second chance um, to share a bit more with you. Well, as far as the European Union is concerned, there are initiatives aiming at a more flexible framework of exceptions and limitations in several member states. I think uh, a well-known example is the United Kingdom, where the debate on flexible lawmaking in that area starts with the Hargreaves reports and so on. Um, we have similar initiatives in Ireland, the Netherlands, and as far as I know, also in Poland. Um, so far, um, these initiatives, uh, in terms of concrete propos proposals, have not led to a proposal for introducing an open-ended fair use provision, which is not surprising because all the lawmaking in that field is finally regulated by the 2001 Copyright Directive of the European Union. And in that directive, member states are bound to a close list of certain prototypes of exceptions and limitations, and a general flexible open-ended norm is not um, a possibility under that EU uh, lawmaking. Um, in terms of concrete proposals, we have now in the UK um, uh, proposals uh, concerning provisions on education, then on uh, research and private studying and copies made and provided by libraries and archives in that context. Um, another prominent example is an extra provision for data mining and a provision for uh, people with uh, disabilities. In the Netherlands, the debate so far has led to an initiative to broaden the traditional right of quotation so as to cover also user-generated content, which would be quite a remarkable move if this was going through the whole legislative process because user-generated content as such is not in the list um, of the European Union Copyright Directive, so this would really be a an extensive interpretation of the right of quotation. Um, further discussion in the Netherlands concerns uh, an exemption of uh, indexing and providing search results on the internet, but this has not led to a concrete proposal for legislative amendments. Um, with regard to the evidence that is used in these processes, well, um, when you consult the Hargreaves report in the UK, um, you find that their overview of um, empirical studies concerning copyright is quite um, um, discouraging because they say there is next to none um, empirical evidence that could be used in the area of copyright. I heard from um, Christian Hanke yesterday that this is not uh, necessarily true. There is some evidence also in the area of copyright, but it seems that these processes in the European Union and in those member states I mentioned are primarily based then on submissions by interested parties. So basically you get a broad stakeholder consultation. Um, you see um, the outcome of these consultations quite clearly in Ireland, where the Review Copyright Committee finally concluded that on the basis of those submissions, they cannot decide on whether or not fair use um, could be a good idea. So they said, well, um, uh, these submissions don't give sufficient 
evidence for one or the other side. So um, the review committee finally contented itself with uh, drafting a fair use provision but leaving it to the further legislative process to decide on whether or not such a provision should be implemented. The Netherlands is an exception in the sense that the Ministry of Economy set out to um, um, establish further evidence, and we have heard from Joost Port uh, the results of that study. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, this is a very promising first step, but when you read the study, you see that it is predominantly anecdotal evidence and case law and interviews uh, that have been conducted in Israel, but it's not an empirical study in the sense of um, a hardline um, data-based study with empirical evidence because this evidence, as Joost already pointed out, is uh, not available also because in countries like Israel and Singapore and Korea where fair use regimes have been implemented, there is not a zero uh, point for measuring the result of such legislation. Um, so on the basis of these experiences, uh, what is my wish list? What, what kind of empirical studies would we really need? Well, um, it would be wonderful to have an empirical study that really deals with the economic effects of flexible limitations and exceptions at this abstract level. So not breaking it down to some concrete case, which economists most of the time tend to do, which I fully understand. I mean, if you want to operationalize the whole uh, research process, it's good to focus on particular types of use. But I fear that if you get an empirical evidence concerning a particular type of use in the further legislative process, people would say, okay, we now know about this specific type, so let's have a specific exception. And this is something different from an open-ended fair use system. So in that sense, I also have some doubts whether um, with empirical sciences you always reach results that would support these um, need for flexible lawmaking that is strongly felt at least in legal circles. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I will talk a little bit about copyright reform in Chile and the use of right in the context of Latin America. Um, let me tell you first that in general, we can say that Latin American countries do not take any advantage of the flexibilities provided by the international law on copyright. We have basically two set of countries. Some countries, like Colombia or Peru, uh, have the approach of, have, they have a, a, um, a list of copyright exception, but there are but because their regulation was adopted in the 90s, they were very scared about the, the, the effect of Internet and digitalization of content. As a result, they adopted two policy measures that diminished the actual scope of the exceptions. The first one was to grant comprehensive protection to economic and exclusive right. And therefore, they don't have a list of exclusive right, but any potential use of copyrighted material is protected by law as an exclusive right of right holders. And additionally to that, because they were scared about that the copyright exception designed by, for the analog environment uh, were um, um, not suitable for a digital environment, they incorporated into their domestic law the three-step test. And therefore, um, the usage of an actual exception can be challenged in court because it doesn't satisfy the three-step test into domestic court. This reduced enormous, enormously the scope of copyright exception in those countries. Other set of countries, countries that adopted regulation before the 90s, like, uh, like Brazil, Argentina, or Chile, uh, have a very short, an extremely short list of copyright exception. This produced several efforts. First, uh, several opportunities for satisfying public interest needs are not satisfied. And at the same time, because those countries uh, criminalize and punish not only of commercial uh, exploitation of wars, but also non-commercial or non-profit non -for -profit infringement, most of the criminal pressure is going uh, against librarians, museums, archives, and schools and universities. Uh, this was the situation in Chile until 2010. In 2010, we uh, got a copyright reform. This copyright reform was pulled because of the free trade agreement we signed with the U.S., and therefore it includes several provisions related to a, a, a regime of, for internet service provider, uh, improvements in the procedures of enforcement, but at the same time, we have the, cha we have the chance to incorporate a modern regime of copyright exceptions and limitations. We didn't have 
uh, proper exceptions at that time. What can I say about those uh, exceptions? Well, some of them were uh, adopted in, in domestic law because they were available in international law, quotation, for example. Other of them were uh, drafted based on the experience of comparative law. Most of the, pro the provisions on uh, reverse engineering of software, for example, were drafted following the European Union law and the U.S. case law. There were also some provisions, for example, the exceptions related to people with disabilities that were drafted thinking in particular cases in the Chilean society, a specific libraries or centers of research that provide access to people with disability but didn't have any legal framework to protect those activities. And there is a four group of exceptions that were based on, um, I wouldn't say empirical, uh, empirical, da uh, empirical studies, but some factual data that it could be relevant. Among those exceptions, I will uh, highlight the exceptions for uh, libraries, museums, and archives. Let me tell you some, something about, about that. Until 2010, there was no exception at all for any of those institutions in the Chilean law. Uh, however, we have a country with 17 million people living in my country. 98% of them uh, is the literary right. It's a middle-income country, and the main language spoken in the country is Spanish. This country in particular, Chile, like all the Latin American countries, are mainly importer of books. Only 3% of the market of books in the world is from Latin America. And in fact, when you, you identify where those countries buy books, you can find that the relation is that for every single dollar that is paying, uh, um, spent in Latin America buying books, Latin America buy $50 in Spain. So the relation is one to 50. In the case of the US market, the relation is one to three. For every single dollar spent by Latin America, for every single dollar spent by the US in buying books in Latin America, Latin America spent three dollars buying books. So we are mainly exporter countries. It doesn't mean that we don't have domestic capabilities in printing. We have, but those capabilities are very limited. 3% of the total production in the world. Uh, usually, printing, when you print the books in Latin America, the printing is from 500 to 800 copies. And usually, only less than 10% of the books get a second printing. So, in addition to those limited capabilities and uh, reliance on, export, on, on, import, on importations, we have a very expensive market for books in relative terms and in absolute terms. Just to give you some examples, buying a paperback book that in the U.S. can cost $10, in Chile can cost $40, in, Portugal, in Brazil can cost $60. So they are very expensive in absolute terms. But also in relative terms, keep in mind that the GDP in Chile is one third of the GDP in the US. Therefore, to, to make it clear, uh, if you take in, in contact, if you count the average income of an uh, American citizen, you can buy a book with, with just one hour of work. You may need a whole day of work to buy the same book in Chile, and two days of work to buy the same book in Brazil. So this created a serious gap in the access to content, particularly in libraries, universities, museums, and archives, as I mentioned. Uh, and during the copyright reform, there was agreement on that point. It was not only an agreement between universities and libraries. In fact, domestic producer of book, the, the domestic uh, industry of publishing was also in agreement, and there was a pro proposals uh, agree with them to push for copyright exceptions and limitations to grant access to content to uh, users. Ultimately, it means that today we have in the copyright, because of the copyright reform, a specific exception that allows preserving books, replacing books, digitalizing and making available copyright material into the facilities of libraries, and the translation of material. They may not be enough, but certainly it means a significant progress for, for, for the Chilean society. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Jennifer Urban. Um, I'm from Berkeley Law, and um, I'm in the 
completely unenvi unenviable position of talking about the U.S., which um, I think many people in this room um, know very well, um, uh, either because you are um, from the U.S. region or because U.S. copyright policy uh, tends to have such an impact around the world that it is, uh, it is a set of policies that um, are confronted by people um, in, in most regions in the world. Um, so I'll be pretty brief on um, what's going on, um, assuming that it's something that people mostly know about, um, and then talk a little bit about what I think about evidence. Um, the, um, 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 the U.S. Copyright Office, um, with our new registrar, a register, excuse me, Maria Palanti, um, has undertaken a, a major project to consider a variety of issues in copyright to um, consider updating it for the digital age. Um, it's sometimes at, referred to at this point as the next great copyright act. And um, the, so the copyright office has been um, doing a variety of studies on orphan works, on, um, on um, artist um, music um, rights and a number of others. Um, Congress has picked up um, some of this discussion and has been at least holding exploratory hearings, um, including last week the Judiciary Committee um, held one on um, intermediary liability and takedown. Um, and so there's quite a bit of discussion going on in traditional legislative reform right now. Um, I don't think anybody thinks that it's going to um, be a very quick process. Uh, the Copyright Office is still bringing in a lot of um, materials and evidence, um, and Congress has many other things to think about, but it's certainly something um, that is open for discussion. I did want to mention that simultaneous with considering policy concerns, um, uh, broadly outside the Copyright Office. The Copyright Office has also undertaken a major initiative on its registration processes on, on digitizing its records, which I think are actually quite important for user rights um, for everyone who uses the copyright system. Um, but if you are able to do better research, and it goes to the empirical point next, um, if you're be able to do better research with these records, as some on the last panel mentioned, I think it will make a difference. So um, that, um, that initiative actually is, a, is an ongoing sort of reform effort that I think um, might be important here. Um, the last bit, again, with which I think people are mostly familiar, as far as um, as far as uh, traditional reform goes, is that there's been a lot of copyright activity in Congress um, in the last few years, but much of it has actually. Um, um, not been um, the kind of reform that is considering directly user rights. It is generally considering something, uh, enforcement or similar questions, and those who are interested in flexibility or user rights um, are faced with using evidence in a more defensive posture, um, and those who are looking for more enforcement are faced with using evidence in a more proactive um, posture. Um, as Jeremy, um, um, as Jeremy also said about Canada, I wanted to say a word about the fact that the United States, being a common law country and also a country with a very executive, a very active executive branch, um, actually accomplishes reform um, outside of um, traditional legislative reform um, very actively and in a variety of ways. Uh, Jeremy talked about courts and cases, and that's very important in the U.S. Um, and not only do we have a common law, uh, well, a quasi-common law system, but we also have fair use um, in place, which means the courts remain a core form for copyright reform or just general change today. Um, again, many people are probably familiar with a lot of what's going on, um, but um, I would commend everyone, um, especially to um, the, the set of cases around books and um, library and the academic uses of materials, the Hathi Trust case, the Georgia State case, the Google Book Search case, those on secondary liability, the Viacom versus YouTube case, um, the Oracle versus Google case, the tests of cable vision um, as far as um, what kinds of secondary markets can develop, and a variety of others, because all of those cases are creating some form of reform um, in the decisions that they are making. Also for sale with Kurt Sang and Monsanto. Um, 
And um, as Jeremy also noted, academic scholarship can be very relevant um, in, these, um, in each of these fora, um, both in um, going into Congress and having academics testify, um, um, but also more directly. So one of the hearings that's been held on the Hill focused directly on the Copyright Principles Project um, that was run by Pam Samuelson at Berkeley and had uh, many voices, um, or to, you know, a group of voices together to think about principles. Um, uh, in the court cases, um, uh, amicus briefs have been picked up a few times, uh, more than a few times, actually. Um, in the argument um, in the Google Book Search case on Monday, um, amicus briefs by academics about academic work using copyrighted works um, were very central to the oral argument. So um, there's certainly place for um, empirical and other academic work. I wanted to say a brief word also about reform initiatives outside of the courts and, and Congress in the executive branch. Um, so again, everybody in the room is very, I think, familiar um, with trade agreements um, and how those are um, being used um, in reform around the world. Um, we, of course, have had um, recently for a few years an IP czar, to use the loose term, um, in the administration, um, which has resulted, I think, in um, a dialogue um, between the executive and between Congress um, and with the Copyright Office um, that all feeds together into um, reform. But I also wanted to mention things that individual agencies are doing. Um, so um, the um, open access policy that was decided for um, scientific articles um, being funded by NIH and a host of other agency a uh, host of other agencies, I think is very important. It's a critical reform or an essential reform. Um, I want to give the very um, uh, modest Mike Carroll, who's a moderate in our panel, um, the recognition for a lot of work that he did um, on, on this reform, which ties again to the point that academic research or evidence I think can be very helpful um, to the executive branch as well as it is considering these. And the Patent and Trademark Office's um, recent decision that the longstanding practice of using articles and file wrappers and in prosecution um, was that they took that to be a fair use. So those are two examples um, of, of reform efforts in a change in policy um, that are not in a traditional Congress. Um, so evidence. Um, most of us are familiar with um, the, and it was discussed on the last panel and some today, on a lot of the evidence that is um, put forth in these discussions in the United States and any of these fora. Um, we have trade um, industry um, numbers um, and modeling for how uh, copyright um, reforms might affect or how the present state of copyright law might affect various um, uh, players, generally large industrial players. We have some economic impact studies and we have some response um, from users. Um, 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 all of this um, has its challenges, um, as everyone has stated already. I had a few ideas um, and examples of things that I think would be helpful. Um, um, one is to look at um, not just whether you get more academic activity um, directly, but to try a second um, layer, which is perhaps not as satisfactory, um, but might be illuminating, which is to look at use of statistics of resources um, and to look at how materials, uh, cultural materials and other materials are propagating um, through society and how they're being used. Now, um, as, um, as um, Joost said, and I absolutely agree, the best case scenario um, for really studying this would be um, to study it before and after an experimental state, a natural experimental state occurs, um, so that you have a policy change and you are able then to see what happens. And this isn't just for usage statistics, this would be for anything. It's a rare opportunity, um, both because it's a, the policy change has to happen um, and it's hard to get right, and also because of the timing is so important. You need a baseline in place. You need to have already studied it when the policy takes a place in order to um, study it again, but I agree that would be helpful. The next best case, I think, um, would be use of open resources or resources that are governed by flexible limitations and exceptions versus other resources. Um, challenges here are comparing apples to apples, um, both the resource and all of the complexities of 
of the different models under which they're distributed, the complexities of the user groups, as many have pointed out. They're often producers and users of cultural materials. Um, but this is something that I think um, can be fruitful and could be fruitful if done um, more widely. Non-comparative um, op option that is still useful um, would be a look at um, open, open use of open resources um, and behaviors where things have long been assumed, but we didn't actually know if the policy was in place. So this is the Patent and Trademark Office example where everybody was using um, the materials in this way because you had to in order to prosecute a patent, um, but we didn't know what the policy was. Those might be useful um, case studies to consider. Um, as far as traditional empirics are concerned, um, quantitative numbers, um, I'm presently working with Joe Karaganis at the American Assembly, and we are gathering a host of other people, Neva Alconcorin um, at Haifa and others, um, to study takedown um, through direct empirical um, research. Um, distribution and use empirics, I think, are also very much needed, um, both in how things are distributed and priced and then how they're used. Enormous challenges with these kinds of studies is getting the data because most of it sits with private um, actors and they, um, publishers or Amazon may not um, be um, interested in handing it over. Same with takedown. An enormous issue that we're running into with takedown is actually dealing with the data when we get it. Um, when you talk about automated takedown processes, bot-based takedown processes, you're drowning in data tens of millions of notices and more. And figuring out how to fairly um, look at those is a, is a difficult problem, but I think important research. Um, best practice methodologies and other careful qualitative work have a lot to tell us. Big challenges here, as have already been discussed, are generalizability and also cost. Um, and I would like to encourage people to think about learning from other methodologies and fields. So the privacy field has been learning a great deal recently and other fields of, um, uh, from decisional work in behavioral economics. And this might be something that would be fruitful. Um, usability and usage studies more generally that often just look at systems. Um, but if we look at um, how people interact with culturally produced material, cultural production, um, that may be fruitful. And there's a lot of research and a lot of methodology out there. Um, um, Martin, um, oh no, um, was actually, um, I think it was Rebecca mentioned Silicon Valley and going to San Francisco. Um, I have on my list industrial research. Annalise Saxinian um, from the Information School at Berkeley wrote a very well-known book in our world called Regional Advantage, um, which is about trade secret uh, law and um, employee um, non-competition agreements and what that means in Silicon Valley. I think there could be a tr tremendous benefit to um, looking at that in um, terms of intellectual property as well. And then the last little, uh, the last bit that I will say, which is a little bit more out there, um, is that um, evidence from evidence from other worlds that shows by analogy um, how policy is happening I think can be very important. And let me give you one um, example going back to the Google Books oral argument earlier this week. Um, and that is about how limitations and exceptions are used in practice. So an oral argument in the Google Books case um, this um, um, earlier in the week uh, um, a brief um, by um, some academic lawyers on behalf of humanities scholars who use the Google Books corpus in order to study um, changes in society over time by using large quantitative studies on the text was very interesting and important um, in the discussion of whether or not this is the kind, the kinds of questions of the case which are about fair use and copyrightability um, uh, have relevance in um, uh, it, whether how things are used um, have relevance to that legal question. So I think that considering evidence of from other fields is also really important. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'll be as quick as possible and probably quicker than the other ones because I'm the last and you are already tired. So let's go. Um, Whatever has moved the recent change in Brazil, and there have been a few, it has not been the economic discourse. It has been mostly the social and political pressure, and mostly the social adequacy of copyright and its possible positive or negative effects 
and all society as a whole. Although the argument, the economic argument has been brought about, uh, data has not been brought about. So basically they're using economic arguments without data. <laughs> Basically, it's not an economic argument. It's a political and social argument. So um, that's basically what's being led. Uh, the banner has been, um, however, there have been a few studies on cultural equipments, cultural access to movie theaters, attendance to movies, theaters, books, and so on, buying books, and so on. So indirectly, yes, it does affect the, the cultural, the copyright industry as a whole, but has been taken not as a study on the copyright industry, but as a study on cultural equipment, its distribution or its concentration, which is the result. The end result found a high concentration of equipment, like theaters, movie theaters, libraries, um, bookstores, and so on in very small cities, and within the cities in specific areas, which of course are the richest areas, therefore that's where they are there. And that has also shown that most of the people, most of the country does not have access to their work, whether because the equipment's not there, so they could not go to the movie or the theater anyway, or because even if there is equipment, the works don't get there, the real works that people don't want to see don't get there, or they take a long time. Let's say a movie is released in Rio and Sao Paulo and Brazil, but by the time it gets to other cities, it's already old and everyone has seen it online already, so it really doesn't do much in that sense, so that's one of the conclusions. However, the, the other studies that have been on the copyright industries, they have all been done by the industry themselves with data provided by themselves that haven't been made available for questioning. Therefore, we all have, okay, this is the conclusion, this is what we have, this is how it works, therefore it should follow this or that. Uh, we have been able to, within those studies, to catch a few things that are not said and therefore would support a limitations argument. But however, we do not have access to the whole data and to tell the truth, I don't really trust the data that has been put forward by the industry without being checked out for any reason. So this is the state where it is now. However, there have been, in July, there have been a couple of changes which already passed into law an amendment to copyright law on a collective management societies. And within that, they are going to be obliged to report every data. All the data is going to be public and will have to be made available, which means it's going to implement now. The, it will come into effect in December, which means next year will be the first year where the data will have to be reported. And the year after, then we're going to start having some more official data on um, basically the music industry and how that, uh, that's affected, how, how much is distributed, how much started from who, who pays what, where, and so on. But that will be next year, and that will be available for everyone. It is in the law, it's public available, free access to everyone uh, from everywhere. So we're going to start to be able to actually have access to that and discuss on the days of that. Um, there's not a real single, as, as far as I know, a single work on copyright limitations, economics of copyright limitations in Brazil. Not a single one. So we basically take whatever is left from the other. Okay, that might apply for limitations here and there, and that's all we can do on that. So I'm really hoping the project goes goes on in order for us to have the basic data there. And the second problem is that to convince the economists, colleagues, economists, oh, listen, it's worth doing it, all well, everyone knows it's very hard, there's no methodology, there's no other study on it, and blah, blah, blah. But now I'm meeting a few economists here, and I will say, see, they are doing it, why can't we do it here, and so on, and on, and hopefully to convince them, to attract them to the copyright field. And I've been trying to do that, actually, invited them for a movie parties or release and other stuff like that, so maybe they'll be convinced that that's a good field, people are nice, therefore they should be studying that instead of being studying industrial economics and so on. But um, that's a way of persuasion and let's see if that will work. Um, we, uh, the amendment on limitations are about to come up, although we've been promised that many times. At this time, I don't think the presidency can postpone it for that long. And the, the, the talks on the political arena is that of the project is that there will 
expand substantially the limitations uh, that will include an open clause or general clause as we call it and I'm pretty sure that in the discussion that will be a huge point on the economic side, however, without any study on it, which means I will grab all the studies I get, I can have access to here and bring it there. So, to, in order to discuss that, so this is the new situ the situation in Brazil. So far, the, ar the leading argument there has been the social impact of the restrictions not how much that economically affects the industry and so on and on and on. But I'll just to finish up, um, I, th I would add another concern from what you said. Uh, I think um, besides the very strict economic study, if we also take a stance on analyzing how much of the use of, how much a new work depends on the use of prior works, would also be very help, helpful in order to see how much of the limitations are important and which limitations are important on that. Especially if we take a stance where, uh, a basic one, where we know that anyone that will be a writer must before be a reader, anyone that wants to be a filmmaker must be a film buff before, and how does that affect the whole thing. My own position is that we have a very wrong, well, I mean, Almost the whole world has a very wrong stake on copyright because we start talking about protection before talking about access. And there's no reason for copyright if there's no access before because there will be no author, there will be no works, and there will be no public because you only become a moviegoer or a theater goer or a reader if you have before been exposed to it and developed the desire for that sort of uh, experience. That's it. Great. Um, so I do know that the audience is uh, waiting to get in. I, I do want to ask for a quick reaction to this proposition. Um, one of the things that we, that we were hearing there is that the discourse around limitations and exceptions can fall into roughly one of three kinds of buckets. So the, the least generous might be the loophole, that it's merely a harmless provision of the law that it permits a use um, that, that doesn't really matter anyway. And so that's sort of, um, the, the to it's almost like a toleration. It's just a tolerated use. Um, the, the, the flip side is the more normative uh, version that we were hearing from Canada, that it's a user's right. That is that without, there's a, a normative commitment to the use with or without the economic evidence. Uh, it's, not, it's not an empirical question about whether the use should be permitted, it's a user's right. But then there might be a middle space in which the economic evidence might actually be important to decide whether the use is Im important or how to value the use um, uh, from an economic perspective. And here I think the, the discourse that, that this project is at least uh, hoping to uh, uh, put out there is the idea that a limitation or exception to the copyright owner's right is an enabling provision. It enables people to do things they would not otherwise do. And one way to think about the enablement is not just the individual who can now access the work, but economically you can invest in the use of the work because it is now legal to make. Because one of the things we were hearing is that the targets of enforcement often are institutions that need to comply with the law. We know that we have a number of individuals in the society who disregard the law and therefore the limitation and exception is irrelevant to their behavior. But the, be the, the behaviors that m where the law matters, the libraries, the educational institutions, the archives, there the presence or absence of the limitation really does have enabling or disabling um, uh, features. And as we heard the, st the story from Malaysia, the absence of limitations and exceptions has measurable impacts. So within the discourse of enabling provisions, I'm wondering are there particular kinds of enablement that you think the law might focus its energy on encouraging and how economic analysis might help in sort of identifying that kind, as you were saying, Jeremy, the, the positive impacts of, the, of these provisions rather than merely the lack of negative impacts from a copyright owner perspective. So I throw it out there. Whoever wants to grab it, grab it. 
I think I would like to leave it to our international partners to talk about the kinds of reforms, but um, I would um, make another um, pitch, although understanding it can't always happen, um, for the natural experiments idea. Um, uh, if we could identify spaces or places and time where um, um, some measurable or quantifiable, describable legal certainty um, a value of legal certainty changes. It either becomes more uncertain or um, more uncertain or less uncertain, more certain for institutional users like libraries and archives or others who need to be law abiding um, in an area that touches on flexibility. And we are able to um, do a study that uh, has a baseline and then and, and then sees um, what the effect has been on them. I think that could be quite beneficial. One thing, just I think it's more a side thing, but uh, one thing I've noticed on the discourse, I noticed, noticed early and I heard I think two or three times on, on the table here, is that, oh, this is, this is common law, this is civil law, and um, I will make a provocation. Uh, I think this is way more of a myth than a reality. And I can see that in a large country like Brazil, the difference between state courts' decisions are much bigger than between Brazil higher court and other countries. Just to tell just one example, I'm sure the difference in Europe too between countries that are civil law traditions are way more different than necessarily between civil law tradition and common law countries. So there is behind that in, in um, civil law tradition countries, the idea that economic studies are not the most important or they are not that valuable in guiding the political discussion, while uh, instead the social discourse, fundamental rights become much more important. However, I see the, the difference, just to be very short, the difference is just a question of more or less openness to interpreting the text, because the text doesn't pre-exist. It will exist only after interpretation, and the civil law countries have been moving uh, way stronger towards more openness and than was before, so I think this is more of a myth. Whenever we talk about, about it, I think we just should concern about that, because that could be one of the reasons why economic studies are not so popular or demanded for in civil or traditional countries. Uh, Martin and then Jeremy. Yeah, answering to <clears throat> that question, I think um, uh, particularly regarding area of research, um, is the question in how far a flexible open norm provides a, a more solid basis for new business models and uh, the development of new, let's say, internet industries. Um, I, I have a feeling from looking at case law and so on that in countries where you have a fair use provision, a newcomer in the marketplace always has a good argument in saying, well, I think this is something that is uh, a legitimate kind of use and I will try to defend it as a fair use. Whereas in a system where you don't have such an opening clause, um, you just check the list of um, traditional exceptions. You don't find a case that really fits um, the kind of use that you are trying to make and that's basically end of the story. So basically you are discouraged as a newcomer with a with an innovative new business model um, because you don't find a match in the list of closed exceptions. So in that sense, um, this would be very interesting and I see this also in the debate in Europe that lawmakers are particularly um, looking for this kind of evidence. If you can make the argument that this is something that fosters innovation and uh, new businesses, then you have a very strong argument for legislative reform. And it's also my feeling that this is something that uh, economists could really show because it is, to my humble understanding, this is an economic category and um, easier to um, operationalize than a more abstract question of whether or not it is good to have it as a user interest or a user right or something. Just want to pick up on um, the point that you mentioned about the phrase user rights and point out that in Canada it's still very much an instrumental right um, and the scope of that right will be delineated in large part 
by, among other things, economic evidence of the impact of, of that right. And it's sort of interesting that in Canada we don't have the user's right bolstered by uh, jurisprudence or values around freedom of expression in the same way uh, that that happens in the United States. So it's somewhat ironic that Canada has adopted the discourse of the user's right without that sort of constitutional impetus around um, freedom of expression, for example. Your second point was also a very good one, and I'll give you an, uh, about enablement and the, the value of a, a limitation, exception, or a user's right as an enabling provision. I'll give you an example of a new provision enacted in Canada's Copyright Modernization Act of 2012. It's uh, Section 29.21. And it provides a user's right to use another work for the purpose of non-commercial user-generated content. It's a specific exception for user-generated content, which is fascinating. It's the only one I know of in the world. Um, now, there's some, some caveats. It has to be for non-commercial purposes, and you have to mention the source and so on. But what's quite interesting is that I think that's, that specific exception doesn't really serve much function on its own because people were unlikely uh, to be sued for non-commercial user-generated content. But what that does is it enables providers of user-generated content to significantly reduce their liability risk for secondary infringement because the primary act is now clearly not infringing uh, in, the, in the circumstances. Just the final point I'll mention about that provision is that one of the conditions you need to fulfill is demonstrate that there's no substantial adverse impact financial or otherwise from your use in the user-generated content. Um, and, and that's something that economic uh, evidence would, would greatly um, guide. Great. Rebecca. So on the Le Le Rebecca and then Albert. So on the topic of national experiments, I think Jeremy's example is a, a really useful one of something that is achieving its actual aim. In Australia, we experimented with flexibility a little in 2006 as part of some limited reforms in response to the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement, where we introduced a new flexible exception just for certain cultural institutions, uh, and they were allowed to, to make certain uses of works as long as those uses complied with the three-step test. So that was the three-step test was actually imported directly into the national legislation. So any librarian or person working in an organization for the disabled who wanted to make use of this flexible exception had to apply international law um, and ask whether, in fact, this use did comply. And, of course, we've got the expert on the three-step test sitting right here and knows that there's not exactly a lot of case law for these librarians and people working for these nonprofit organizations to draw upon in making this synthesis to work out whether, in fact, that was the case. So that's one national experiment that I think was a complete failure. And, and Wright holds have pointed to that and said, well, look, it's uncertain. People aren't using it because it's, it's too uncertain. But I think uh, you can design flexibilities that achieve their ends much better than uh, that particular experiment managed. And Albert, and then Karen. Thank you. Um, it's interesting the difference between uh, talking about copyright issues in Latin America and talking about the copyright issues in, in the U.S. because here we are focusing on, on users like and to some extent how it can improve uh, opportunities for innovation. Uh, in Latin America, the, the, the situation is much more difficult, more, more, more different. I will say that actually copyright, instead of promoting uh, innovation, punish innovation. Uh, why I say that? You can explain that for two reasons. One at the theoretical level, copyright regulation in Latin American country is not drafted with the idea of balancing progresses with protection, but it's drafted with the French idea that we are protecting creators. And that provides a broader uh, protection to copyright. So innovation is not an issue in the copyright law in Latin America. And the second is because in, in normative terms, all countries punish infringement. And infringement is any usage that is not allowed by copyright, out, uh, copyright holders or the law. The law forbids most uh, of the usage, not only for commercial or for profit, but also for non-commercial and non-profit. Therefore, the opportunities to take advantage of copyright as a user to innovate are much more smaller than in, than in the U.S. 
I, I, I am not kidding about that. But copyright in Latin American countries punish, punishes innovators. They don't provide, it doesn't provide any room for innovation. And sorry, and, and another, another point about the statistical uh, opportunities to, to, to work in Latin American issues or uh, to do empirical studies on, on this matter. I will say that it's not only that, that we, we talk more about theoretical terms about the f social function of property and particularly copyright, but to be honest, developing countries, it's really hard to work with statistical or with empirical data in developing countries. I have been working the last three years trying to collect information about copyright issues in Latin America, and I have found information only in two uh, niche. The first one is co criminal co copyright enforcement. That's why. Why is that? Uh, basically because in the last 10 years, Latin American countries have been moving from an inquisitorial system of uh, criminal justice to an adversarial one. So there is a lot of empirical studies on criminal enforcement in Latin America. And certainly you can find on enforcement in copyright, particularly in Chile, Mexico, and Argentina. Uh, and the second area where you can find uh, empirical uh, data, factual data, empirical data uh, through the time is in the book market and to, to, to which extent countries are producing, buying, selling, using uh, um, uh, books and publishing material. But in areas like music, the data is totally opaque. In areas like software, it doesn't exist. In, like, in areas like video game, it doesn't exist. So one of the problems that why Latin American copyright reform is standing by the, the perspective of human rights, social fusion of the property, is basically because we don't have that. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to hark back to your question, Mike, um, about if we think about exceptions and limitations as enabling provisions, um, what kind of empirical research would we need to um, support a case for meaningful exceptions and limitations? And I think that um, in the global south, we need to prioritize um, the Global South's own priorities. So, for example, in South Africa, no one cares very much about file sharing of copyright infringement um, music. It's, it's not high on government priorities. But if you cast your arguments and your empirical evidence within the framework of, I suppose, access to learning materials, for example, that would be much more um, credit worthy, I think. And so I would say that um, we, those of us who are able to carry out these studies need to focus in those contexts, and that would be most meaningful, I think. Great. Can I invite the audience now to uh, ask a few questions? And uh, please do use the mic and identify yourself. Um, and we are recording this, so just be comfortable with that fact. <laughs> uh, my name is Elliot Maxwell, and I'm going to speak a little bit about a piece of evidence that Mike uh, knows well uh, that's not specifically focused on copyright, but I think can be extrapolated very, very easily into the discussions that you're having now. It deals with the issues of the open of public access to uh, taxpayer-funded research, and in particular, the uh, uh, policy of the NIH to make that research available. The Committee for Economic Development did a study of the effect of that policy, uh, which went into effect in 2008, published in a study in uh, 2012, that looked at the implications of making that. Uh, material available. It was specifically not uh, a copyright issue because the publishers which had, who had originally sought to make it a copyright issue decided that was not a particularly strong card to play because the government had, as part of its grant processes, said that there was an obligation on the grantees to make the material available at the time of publication. But the study looked at a series of uh, economic studies that looked at the effect of sharing of research material on either academic citations but more importantly on both further research and commercialization. The gold standard of, that, of those set of studies is one done by Heidi Williams at MIT who looked at the uh, Human Genome Project and she looked at it in comparing two different models. One was Solera, which was a company that was doing research to decode the genome and would rent out its uh, 
uh, research results but would not make them public versus the Human Genome Project, which said all of the findings should be placed in the gene bank and would be made available immediately. And what she did was to compare two things as a result of this research. Uh, one was the links between decoding the genome and establishing the phenotypes, those kinds of uh, conditions which were related to the genetic condition, and then the development of commercial tests which would test for the genotype-phenotype link. And economic, intellectual property theory, as cited by the publishers and others, would say that the parties that had early access to the data, that would be renting it from Solera, that had a head start because they were not getting it at the same time as everybody else, should have developed diagnostic tests more quickly than those people who were starting at the same time as everybody else with exactly the same data as everybody else. But the availability of the material more broadly led to a 30 percent increase in both detection of genotype phenotype links and development of commercial tests, the theory being that more people pursuing different paths of research from this material led to faster development of commercial tests. So this is a kind of classic economic test of what's the economic value of access and all of the issues of limitations and exceptions, if one takes the, what Mike was just suggesting about enabling, is to say that greater access Leads, leads to more people pursuing more different kinds of research, different paths of tests, and greater economic growth and development. There were other, other studies that were found in, in that study, the mega study of the report. They all have, most studies have this difficulty that people have pointed out repeatedly about having not having a starting point and an ending point, a beginning to which one can compare or not. But there's at least one other a study that had a beginning and an end uh, by Fiona Murray at MIT, which compared transgenic mice in the 90s, which were used for cancer treatment. And they eventually, there was a start to these studies, and there was an end to these studies, and the results were very similar to what was later found by Fiona Murray, which is that people who used mice that were available for more different ways of studying produced research that was cited more often and moved closer to commercialization than studies where the uses were restricted by licensing. So there is that, and there is a third study to call to your attention, which will be published shortly, which has just been done comparing um, 44 medical journals in the United States and abroad and materials that were open within these journals and patent applications in the period 2005 to 2012. And the results of this study is that those articles that were open led to a 30 percent increase in the likelihood that they would be cited in patent applications than articles that were not available by via open access. And the economic literature tends to take patent applications and patent grants as a surrogate for both innovation and economic growth. This report looks very carefully at all patent applications using the 44 leading journals and again what you see is things being more open led to uh, results which suggest greater innovation and greater economic growth. So it may be worth thinking about I, uh, the surrogates for issues about exceptions or limitations using open access as a, as a surrogate for the results of those parts of copyright law. Great. Thanks. Uh, sir. My name is Austin Isfan, the area with the telespheres. And just to, I guess, follow up on that question is we're talking about copyright here today. And the sister or brother of that would be patents. And um, my question is, is the problem with patents 
very similar and on the same track with copyright problems, or is it completely different? If so, why and how so? Thank you. Let's just take them all since we're going to take a break, and then we'll uh, pick and choose as we can. Go ahead. Hi, uh, uh, I'm Jonathan Band. Um, and from a very high level, it seems that um, to some extent there's a – one of the problems here is that a lot of what – we were, we're talking about both in the previous panel and this panel is sort of uh, as a, on, a, on a practical level is responding to the studies done by the content industries that, uh, you know, who, 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 studies that have virtually no validity. And part of the problem is, 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 is as academics, you have to be intellectually honest and your response to those dishonest studies is to say, well, we need to construct honest studies. We need to think of how would we really demonstrate what is the impact of copyright uh, on uh, economic growth and so forth. But, you know, and, and we've seen that that's a very hard thing to really study. Um, and that suggests to me that maybe rather than sort of just saying, okay, well, how do we come up with better evidence uh, how do we come up with better studies to solve this very difficult problem because we believe that those other studies have no validity. It, it seems that uh, a very important service is to simply focus on debunking those other studies. Now, to some extent, that's a trivial exercise. You know, any economics graduate student, you know, in 15 minutes can tell you, point out 15 different things, but still it would be very powerful whenever one of these uh, bogus industry studies come out, if a bunch of economists come together and say, okay, this latest study is, you know, has no validity for the following five reasons, but do it in two pages and not in a long economic paper. I mean, I think that that would have, uh, uh, you know, the debunking is not to be trivialized and may have more impact than a very complex economic study that is better designed but then may lead to inconclusive results. Secondly, um, I, I think it's, uh, uh, and this, you know, this picks up from uh, Jennifer's point, and I think also Alan's point, is, is one should not overlook the importance of anecdotal evidence. I mean, anecdotal evidence is enormously influential, uh, and Jennifer sort of talked about how, you know, we can see that clearly in, uh, uh, you know, ju judicial uh, decisions, um, but you, you can also, and that doesn't mean that there's no role for economists, I meaning I think even in developing good anecdotal evidence, or, you know, really good anecdotal evidence has a lot of quantitative basis. You want to get the numbers right in those anecdotes, and a lot of that would involve, you know, maybe it's microeconomists rather than macroeconomists, but it does involve econ economic analysis of, of data to come up with you know, the good anecdotes and to come up with the numbers that show why this is a compelling story. And just to close, I mean, there is no better example, you know, in, in the various sort of lobbying I've done, you know, in, in, in TPP and other contexts, you know, when, the, when people say, well, tell me why fair use is important or, or show me why fair use is important. All I have to do is say Google, okay? and explain to them why Google is all based on fair use. And, and you have $150 billion of market value based on fair use. And once you sort of explain that to them, that's important. Now, where the economists could come in is to, you know, be able to demonstrate what is the economic value and, and everything that flows from something like Google. But the anecdote of Google is enormously important for fair use. Just one other quick example on, on you know, uh, uh, Brandon and I have been working uh, and put together uh, an article that just sort of has all these anecdotes, all the horror stories of collecting societies around the world. You know, that, and I think that even that can be expanded and more stories can be added and, you know, you can drill down on any, you know, on certain collecting societies and the numbers of the, you know, what, what are their, the economics of that society, you know, where the money comes in, where does it go out, what happens to it. But, Again, those, those stories, those looking at that anecdotal evidence in, in close detail can be very powerful in uh, uh, really promoting uh, uh, exceptions and limitations. Thanks. We call that qualitative evidence, if it's done as fully as you were describing, I think.
<laughs> yes, we hope for good qualitative evidence too, uh, yeah. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, Mora Degbal, uh, previously at the University of Baltimore Center for International Comparative Law now with uh, Plasmaria Technologies LLC. The, the comment or the observation or question I have is if we characterize the entire copyright regime globally as on the one end either punitive because it wants to prevent violation and protect the originator and on the other side permissive because it wants to help with growth and development. Um, in your mind's eye, if you had a choice to bring suit in either a permissive or a, or a punitive system, what choices would you make? It's a generalization to be sure, but I'm trying to test the two ends of that spectrum. And if you can fold into that, any observations you wish to put in with regard to what kind of ev evidentiary basis do you have to bring to that task? I mean, a lot of it we've talked about is electronic and maybe not in book form. Uh, codes of evidence are very different in different regimes. So if you can say something about that on the practicality side of it, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Great. So quick reactions since we are mindful of time, but bid in. So Martin. Sure. Um, I have a quick comment on the first question. Is it really um, relevant whether it's patent law or copyright law? Well, the answer from um, at least a European perspective is, well, there is a conceptual difference. Um, unlike the US, we don't have a general clause saying for the progress of science and the arts. So um, the basis for patent law is clearly a utilitarian one, that you want to um, incentivize uh, new technical solutions. Whereas, and Alberto uh, mentioned that also earlier, in the area of copyright, there is still a very strong foundation based on personality rights, which would see copyright as a kind of absolute right following from the idea that the work is a materialization of the personality of the individual author. And this would mean that you don't have this idea of um, achieving a greater societal goal. Um, the idea is much more clear-cut and simple. You want maximal, maximal protection for something that belongs to the individual author because of the link with his or her personality. So um, if you follow this theoretical line of argument, there's a true difference. Having said that, we see that there's a move in the European Union discourse even to the more utilitarian view asking what is the final result for society. You see that clearly in the recitals of um, copyright legislation at EU level. So I think even um, in, in this area where we traditionally have the difference between um, different theoretical approaches. We see a move to um, questions that can be posed in the same way in the area of patent law and copyright law. So it's, it's getting more equal also in that sense. And then um, the, the final question on how to bring um, a lawsuit in a permissive or a punitive system. I think um, um, the difference for uh, the claimant is not so obvious. I mean, you, you, you just argue your case, so you, you provide the evidence for infringement. The difference is rather on the side of the defendant. Can the defendant bring arguments based on general policy arguments, like saying, well, okay, um, if, if we look at it um, as, as a static um, act I have done, then it is an infringing act, but listen, there we, we have to include second thoughts. Like, this is something that is very important for, I don't know, innovation social, cultural, economic purposes. So uh, basically the evaluation, the assessment that is finally made by the judge gets a more balanced one. Whereas in a purely punitive system, um, you have more the, the automated result that you bring a claim, you argue your case, and then it's infringement. And if uh, you can't provide a defense on the basis of a closed list of exceptions and limitations, then that's end of the story, regardless of whether or not you have some very good reason for um, getting involved in the use you are carrying out. Jeremy and Rebecca, and then we're going to have to cut it off. In so I'll just be really brief then. I think um, uh, our last panel talked already about the methodological differences between users' rights or limitations and exceptions in copyrights uh, versus patents, and most of that revolves around the availability of data. But I would add to that a normative distinction, and that's the simple fact that copyright can last for a century and a half when a patent lasts for 20 years. And the vast majority, well, what's the vast majority? That's an empirical question. But a lot of uh, 20th century uh, culture is 
protected by copyright because you don't need to register it. So I think there's both a methodological and a, a normative distinction between uh, limitation exceptions uh, in patents and copyrights. I just want to make a very quick uh, counterpoint to Martin's perspective that uh, utilit uh, utilitarian uh, is becoming more influential in the, the traditionally natural right jurisdictions. I'm really feeling in the utilitarian jurisdictions, it's going the other way. Like so often we're hearing these arguments that reduced infringement should be an aim of copyright in and of itself, regardless of whether it achieves any of the underlying cultural aims of encouraging the most widespread creation and dissemination of data. So I think the point that was made earlier that there's not such a big distinction um, between these two traditions is exactly right because we're coming together. Uh, I think the economic studies also we could face, which I haven't really seen one, on how much the states uh, have to spend, how much it costs enforcement as a whole. That's another thing to see if it's worth enforcement or just open up the systems. I haven't really seen that much of that. Okay. If we could please give our panel a hand. Uh, we are, we are the, the busy law school that we are, this room is booked uh, immediately after us, so we need, do need to start the keynote roughly on time, which means our longer break that was scheduled is now a short, uh, quick break to take care of necessary things, and then please rejoin us um, at 535 so we can get started and give Sunil his full time.
So we're, we're going to um, conclude by inviting uh, Sunil Abraham to have a few words with us, um, just by way of, of brief uh, introduction. So Sunil is the Executive Director on the Center of Internet and Society, with Pidgeup has been working with uh, for many years. It's located in, in Bangalore, in India. Um, he's also the, the founder in, in 1998 of Mahiti, which is a high-tech firm that employs about 50 engineers and does communications and technology work. He's an Ashoka and a Floss Fellow and a former manager for the UNDP uh, Open Source Network. And we're very happy to have Sunil join us today. And so please take us up. Uh, good evening. I'll start with a couple of apologies. Uh, the first is I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, <laughs> the, the second is that it is 3 a.m. in Bangalore. So if, so if I don't make uh, much sense, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm also not a lawyer, so please don't ask me any tough questions. <laughs> Uh, the work I'm presenting is not my own, so I'll give uh, credit to those who did all the work. Uh, Amber Kak, Neha Chowdhury, Puneet Nagraj, and Gavin Pereira. In my presentation that will focus mostly on innovation in the telecom sector in India, uh, I will touch upon consumer protection law, uh, compulsory licenses both for copyright and patents, and also royalty caps. I don't know if royalty caps is a common policy instrument across other jurisdictions. Uh, I will begin with the content layer on these devices, uh, but first sketch a little bit the overall scenario in India. In a country with 1.3 billion people, uh, only 10% has access to the Internet. Only 5% of this 10% have regular access to the Internet. The other five uh, are people that visit cyber cafes and also users that have accessed a single data service through their mobile phones. This is including activities such as downloading ringtones or music onto a non-smartphone. Uh, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India says that there are 900 million subscribers uh, but that translates only to 600 million users of mobile phones in the country. Uh, about 150 million phones are sold every year, and only 10% of these phones are smartphones. The rest are what we call feature phones. Uh, the first finding, and this is uh, research conducted by Amba Kak, a Google fellow based at my center, is that rights holders are competing with pirates on exactly the same price point. There are uh, five ways you can legally access music on a phone. The first is online streaming. This obviously works only on smartphones. This is ad supported and is completely free of cost. Uh, the second is online music store. Again, this works only on smartphones. And the price point varies from 1 to 15 uh, rupees per song. So that's 2 cents uh, to about 25 cents per song, depending on which store you go to. Uh, the song available for 2 cents comes with DRM. and uh, the songs available for 25 cents comes without DRM. Uh, the third uh, option is bundled music store. This was launched by Nokia. If you bought a Nokia handset, then it also came with a package deal uh, which allowed you to access a music catalog. It was free for the first year, and from the second year onwards, it was $1.5 a year, a month, sorry. And the main channel for music access on mobile phones in India, including uh, feature phones, is what we call VAS music, or value-added services music. Uh, and on this uh, platform, a single song costs two cents. This is exactly the same price point 
if you were to access music illegally on your phone in India. Illegal access uh, to music on your phone meant two things, because most of the mobile phone users don't have access to the Internet, so they're unable to torrent music themselves and then transfer it onto their phones. It meant that you go either to the person repairing your mobile phone, and they will show you their catalog and allow you to copy 100 or 200, perhaps even 500 songs onto your phone or device for about two cents per track. And the innovation in India, which I doubt occurs in many other jurisdictions, is what we call mobile chip piracy. So you go to a vendor, the same vendor that sells you illegal DVDs and CDs, and he is also selling you a mobile phone memory card, which is preloaded with content. This is very popular in second-tier cities and is the primary source of circulation of non-mainstream music. So the Indian music industry estimates that they lose about $65 million every year to mobile chip piracy. Uh, however, the size of the legal market is also quite large. Uh, the overall revenue for the vast industry every year is about $4.3 billion. Uh, there are varying estimates of how much of this is music. But we know for sure that at least $1 billion is music annually on this platform. This includes everything, the full MP3, ringtones, and callback tunes. This billion dollars is split rather unequally. Uh, there are several players in between the record label and the user. So the user pays the telco, who pays the value-added services provider, who pays the content aggregator, and finally the record label gets paid. And, mus and music comes the other way, or content comes in the opposite direction. So the telco keeps the giant share, which is 65% of this billion dollar pie. Uh, the vast operator gets 10%, the content aggregator gets 10%, and 15% is given to the government as tax. Uh, what we found in the research is that the whole system is filled with pervasive fraud at all levels. There is business-to-business -business fraud and also business-to-consumer fraud. So the $65 million figure is what the rights holders are complaining about. They are saying that consumers are ripping us off for $65 million. But let's find out how much businesses are ripping off consumers. Uh, the business-to-business -business fraud is mostly underreporting and false reporting, uh, refusing to identify content through metadata, etc. And the business to consumer fraud is of three types. Subscribing consumers to services that they didn't ask for, uh, renewing services without checking with consumers, and the third type is straightforward billing fraud. That means uh, false items on your bill with no relationship either to any service that you have subscribed to, just false billing, mostly happening at the telco level. So the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India decided to work on this, and this is where the consumer law kicks in. Uh, they started by blacklisting VAS operators, but the VAS operators uh, re-emerged under new brands under the same holding company. So that didn't work. In July 2012, uh, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India said that if a vast service has to be initiated or renewed, then the consumer must confirm or consent via SMS, email, or fax. The fax bit, of course, I don't understand because most of these consumers have no access to facts. 
this turned to be a bit too stringent because most Indian consumers also don't use SMS. So they relaxed the guidelines in July this year and they said that consumers must subscribe twice uh, to the same service. They must go through the subscription process twice and then that is taken as a legitimate subscription of service or a legitimate renewal of service. This led to almost within the next three, four months, a 60% shrinkage in the consumer base and an even larger shrinkage in revenues. So if you calculate this back onto the billion dollars, uh, this is about uh, anywhere from 300 million to 600 million dollars of fraud annually conducted upon consumers uh, with several parties working together in collusion, rights holders, content aggregators, and technical intermediaries. So in order to protect user rights, you don't always have to look at intellectual property law. As Jeremy Malcolm has adequately demonstrated through his research, often consumer law is a better place to start when you are protecting uh, consumer rights. Sideloading license. This is an, another innovation that started in India in 2009 that tried to legitimize the pirate activity happening with both mobile chip piracy and loading of content by those repairing mobile phones. We have three such licenses in India today, and they range from about $185 to $370 annually per shop, regardless of how many consumers they have and regardless of how many uh, of the volume of music transferred onto these devices. Uh, the first license is called the MMX license, and it was launched in 2009 seven labels in four states, four North Indian states. Uh, the second license is called the Hangama license, launched by T-Series. T-Series holds 70% of the Hindi music catalog. If you've ever watched an uh, Indian movie, you will realize that music is a very important component of our culture. Uh, and the third license is the Cell Music license, launched by Simca, this is the South Indian Music Producers Association, uh, and it is mostly for the South Indian uh, states. Uh, this has been relatively successful. The MMX license reported $2 million of revenue last year. What this does is it legitimizes an illegal activity in the market without shifting the price point. So even after the mobile phone repair shop subscribes to one of these licenses, they don't increase the price point. They keep the price point at two cents, but now it is a semi-legal operation. Semi-legal because consumers' tastes are quite varied, and often there is music at this shop's catalog or in this shop's catalog that is not represented by uh, the license uh, provider. And when police raid an operation, often the owner of the shop will show one such license, but this does not necessarily mean that they have rights to distribute North Indian music or South Indian music or even non-mainstream non music. Uh, there is technical innovation happening here. Uh, at the moment, some of the technical intermediaries are working on software that will allow the rights holders to more closely track and monitor which tracks are being downloaded and used so that uh, royalty can be split more accurately across copyright societies and artists. So this is just a voluntary measure, not taking advantage of uh, a provision in law. The trust deficit because of pervasive fraud, as I said earlier, 
everybody is ripping off somebody in the value chain. Telcos are defrauding the VAS platforms, who in turn are defrauding the content aggregators, who in turn are defrauding the record labels. Because of the pervasive uh, trust deficit, there has been a rise in what we call technical intermediaries. One more uh, point in the, in the chain. Uh, in, in 2011, one such technical intermediary became rather popular. Uh, this was a company called Mime360. They represented 40 to 45 percent of the rights holders, and except for two of the bigger players in the VAS market, all the other VAS providers and online platforms signed up with the technical intermediary. So by allowing for greater monitoring, they are hoping to address the trust deficit. Because the trust deficit existed, uh, rights holders were refusing to license their content on a usage basis. They were insisting on something called a minimum guarantee. This was an annual upfront payment. And the annual upfront payment was uh, around $300,000 a year. The moment Mine 360 was introduced and rights holders got a sense of what the actual consumption value, uh, volume was, instead of shifting to a pay-per-use type licensing mechanism, they just multiplied the minimum guarantee by f f 5 or 10, taking minimum guarantees up to 3 to $1.5 million a year. Then MIME 360 had to shut down. Uh, and the whole system uh, collapsed. Now, another online intermediary is setting up one such technical platform. Uh, this is going to be called Atlantis. And the only reason why uh, the record labels are trusting this platform is because the person heading the project comes uh, from uh, their industry. So one wonders uh, whether this has a key person problem. What happens if this person is run over by a bus? Maybe that pl platform will also collapse. Uh, the extremely high minimum guarantees have meant that most VAS providers and online service providers of music are going out of business. So they are wondering if they should apply for a compulsory license. Uh, the Indian copyright law allows, uh, potentially can allow for such a license. Uh, the grounds in the law state, owner of copyright has refused to allow communication to the public by broadcast of such works on terms which the complainant considers reasonable. Uh, of course, the key word here is broadcast. And since online services can be both interactive and non-interactive, the question before uh, the Copyright Board will be whether interactive services also count as broadcast to the public. Uh, after the 2012 amendment to the law, uh, the Indian Copyright Law requires copyright societies to publish their tariff schemes publicly, and any person aggrieved by the tariff scheme may appeal to the Copyright Board to remove any unreasonable element, anomaly, or inconsistency therein. So it, they have basically strengthened uh, the compulsory license provision. Even though we do have a compulsory license provision in the letter of the law, it has almost never been used. The first license uh, was applied for in 2001, when radio stations, FM radio stations, approached the Copyright uh, Board, complaining that the music labels were charging too much. Uh, the Copyright Board spent two years thinking it through and then arrived at an interim decision. Immediately, this was challenged in the Mumbai and Delhi High Courts. 
it finally reached the Supreme Court of India, which referred the matter back to the Copyright Board. The Copyright Board in 2008 uh, started hearing the matter again, and in 2010 gave a final decision, which is 2% of net advertising revenue. That was uh, far too low uh, in retrospect and did not adequately differentiate between time zone, markets, types of radio stations, etc. But uh, this is, uh, the story is very similar to the grant of the first uh, compulsory license under patent for Nexaware. So you know that uh, the controller general for patents, designs, trademarks and industrial designs uh, granted the first Indian compulsory license on a patent in medicine three days before his term expired to prevent uh, any rollback through political pressure. And even with the first copyright compulsory license issued by the Copyright Board, overnight all the, uh, the decision was emailed perhaps for the first time to all uh, parties involved and the <coughs> uh, Registrar for Copyrights issued licenses to all the FM radio stations that night without going home to prevent uh, further litigation on the matter. So even though user rights may be enshrined in the text of law, sometimes it's rather complicated to exercise those rights. Um, we spoke to some government officials who, of course, refused to be named. What is strange about this study is nobody is willing to be named. We spoke to officials in the American government also involved in collecting societies here. Even they refused to be quoted or named in our study. So it's not specifically an Indian problem. Uh, the official said that the copyright provision uh, could be exploited by both interactive and non-interactive uh, mobile services, mobile and internet service providers. So there is potentially hope uh, because uh, these intermediaries need to be protected. Uh, otherwise, the record labels are not going to work on making their music available on the mobile phone or through the internet. Uh, I will end with Amber's study here. Uh, I will just touch upon briefly the potential for a similar study on video, uh, though we have done no work at all on it. I went to the neighboring uh, cyber cafe, and there I saw the cyber cafe owner was downloading uh, Hindi and South Indian cinema and then compressing the, uh, the files he downloaded to a much smaller size. He had very sophisticated compression software. So I asked him what he was doing. So apparently there is a similar sideloading uh, phenomena for videos. Uh, many people who live in slums uh, and who are not happy with what they have on television just lie in bed and on their really small mobile phone screens with earphones watch movies, full-length movies, on uh, the mobile platform. Uh, since this is not a large-scale phenomenon, we still haven't launched any research on it, but I'm sure this is going to be equally interesting research. Uh, moving, moving on to uh, patents, uh, I've told the Spice Popcorn story before, so I don't want to repeat it. I'll tell another story about uh, one of the five largest IT companies in India. Uh, that company is sitting on a $25 billion cash reserve, and that's rather tempting to rights holders across the globe. A uh, large multinational company with a very big uh, patent portfolio, perhaps the biggest in the world, uh, representatives from their patent team gets on a private jet and they land in Bangalore airport and then they send a message to the CEO of the large Indian IT company saying that we'd like to have, uh, we've just arrived on our private jet and we'd like to have audience with you. So the CEO is obviously flattered and he calls them in and when they meet him they say that we have a quarterly target to raise revenues from our patent portfolio. 
This is uh, 14 of our patents that your product, and as you know, Indian software companies usually don't have products, but some of them are slowly beginning to transition from services to products. Uh, they say that your product is infringing these 14 patents, and we want $50 million for a five-year license or something like that. So you would think that this is hardly anything for a company that's sitting on a $25 billion ca cash pile. But uh, when the negotiations begin, what the multinational company with the large patent portfolio says is, just imagine if news goes out that uh, both of us are engaged in patent litigation, what will happen to your share value? So that becomes the clinching argument, and all five pay regularly. So this is an annual phenomenon. Every year, the plane comes again, a different company is targeted, and uh, they pay. So I'm hoping that uh, more and more Indian companies will begin to have a public policy stance on uh, patents. But our business is mostly, our research is mostly focused on uh, the mobile phone. The problem statement is that voluntary pools and licensing is not reducing uncertainty for manufacturers. As you know, on the LTE standard, there are four pools. Even if you license into one pool, you're not protected from litigation from any of the other rights holders. Section 84 of the Indian Patent Act says that any interested party can approach the Controller General for Patents, Designs, and Trademarks, and the grounds are failure to meet reasonable requirement of the public with reference to the invention. That's ground one. Two, unavailability of the patented invention, and this is important, at a reasonable, affordable price to the public. So it's not a reasonable, affordable price in the RAND French sense to the manufacturer. It should be reasonable to the public. And uh, this is a public that pays only $100 for a smartphone. The third ground is non-working of the patented invention in the territory of India. Uh, the first compulsory license was granted and upheld by the Intellectual Property Appellate Board in March 2013. And this is for next surveyor. Uh, Bayer, of course, has said that they're going to appeal the dis decision. They're going to take it through the courts. Uh, to take this research forward, uh, we have a collaboration with IIT Madras. Uh, Professor Junjunwala is an advisor to the Indian government and also serves on the Telecom Standards Development Organization. And he has asked us to do work on LT Release 12. So we went and spoke to some of the manufacturers of LT infrastructure equipment. This is backhaul gear. And they told us that you don't have to worry about standard essential patents. That was news to me. I thought if we are going to approach the Controller General and ask for a compulsory license on the patents related to the LTE standard, Release 12, then we should ask for a compulsory license on all standard essential patents. Uh, the vendor says that that's not important. He introduced a new term to my dictionary, and he calls them seminal patents. So this is a subset of the standard essential patents around which there has been litigation. That means, or around which uh, royal, uh, royal, royalty negotiations have been conducted. This means that the rights holder is relatively sure of uh, the claims made in that patent application. Uh, which also means that many of the so-called standard essential patents are not standard essential at all. Uh, in order to give this a public interest twist, uh, we can't just limit it to those patents that are useful on the infrastructure side. We'd also have to go for those patents that have to be worked on the device end. 
uh, we are now uh, reaching out to these manufacturers and some of them have agreed uh, to share their uh, landscaping pat patent landscaping data with us. Uh, this is because the patent wars on the mobile device have finally come to India. Uh, earlier this year, Ericsson took Micromax to court over 14 patents. Unfortunately, this is still not in the public domain, so we don't know uh, what those 14 patents are about. And uh, as an interim settlement encouraged by the court, Micromax has agreed to pay Ericsson 100 crores. 100 crores is uh, about 20, 20 million dollars as an interim uh, payment before but the case continues. Micromax then uh, complained to the Competition Commission uh, saying that uh, interim, asking for an interim injunction against the distribution and uh, sale of these devices amounts to anti-competitive behavior and the Competition Commission has invited uh, my center to comment on uh, this case that the Commission is now going to investigate. Uh, unfortunately, since we don't know what the patents are, it's very difficult to comment. Uh, if we manage to get this through, uh, since both the infra manufacturers and the device manufacturers are willing to take the application for the compulsory license to the Controller General, but then we could potentially get even more ambitious. Uh, my dream would be to have a device level patent pool for all uh, sub-100 dollar devices. This is because the Indian government has been promoting a sub-100 dollar or a sub-50 dollar tablet called the Akash tablet and that tablet as far as I'm concerned infringes on many patents so it's illegal in some sense so in order to make one of their pet projects successful, uh, we are hoping that they will bite such an, uh, an idea. Uh, hopefully we will get the Ministry for Human Resource Development uh, to file for the compulsory license. Uh, the complications are, especially in India, that the manufacture does not really happen in India. Uh, it's a very long and complicated story. Uh, it starts off in Taiwan at a company called MediaTek that produces the kit. This is the chip, the board, and the antenna. Then that is transferred to Shenzhen, where the rest of the phone is put together. The so-called mobile phone manufacturers of India, this is Lava, Micromax, Spice, uh, Carbon, all they do is take a plane, uh, and go to Shenzhen with a USB drive with their logo on it. Once they reach a factory in Shenzhen, they are given a menu card of options that they can choose. So for the Spice Popcorn M9000, all Spice does is says, pick a projector, yes, uh, a dual SIM card, yes, a receiver for terrestrial television, yes, a receiver for FM radio, yes, uh, tripod stand, yes, uh, LED based torch, yes, um, external speakers, yes, and then for about $100 that device can be uh, sold in India. So, and it usually takes about 45 days or 50 days for the uh, factories in Shenzhen to actually produce these devices. There is uh, the phenomena of Shenzhai, which, of course, we have not researched, but this is possible, this rate of innovation is possible in Shenzhen because during the day, the very same factories make devices for BlackBerry and uh, Apple and other uh, global brands, and, and they informally share the bill of materials amongst each other, and therefore for the Indian companies, they're able to pack all the innovation into a single device. Uh, if you register a patent in India, uh, the patent office requires that you annually file a form 
about the working of the patent, including details about the royalty you receive from entities that are allowed to work the patent in India. So we looked at all of uh, uh, some of Qualcomm's filings, and it was very interesting to see that some of these factories in China and Taiwan were listed on that filing as uh, license to work the patent for uh, sale in India. That means we don't have to worry about those patents when we assemble the pool in India and when we ask for a compulsory license on the pool. Uh, this makes the research project even more complicated. And the uh, next complication, perhaps the final complication is many of the patents for the features on the phone are not even registered in India. So if you take uh, a feature like the battery, in the U.S. patent office there may be 200 or 300 patents connected to the battery, but in India that would be just 10 or 20 patents. So uh, we need to look uh, through the filings in the Indian patent office very, very carefully. Um, I'll end by talking about uh, royalty caps. In the year 1991, India earned $0.6 million from the intellectual property it licensed to foreigners. And for the intellectual property that it licensed from foreigners, India paid foreign entities uh, $49.5 million, about 50 times. Uh, what we earn is what we pay foreign entities. In 2010, what we paid rose to $2.4 billion, and what we earned was $60 million, roughly the same percentage. This does not include any copyright royalty, because copyright royalty is not reported to our central banks the same way as trademark royalty and patent royalty is reported. Till, that, till 2009, we had something called a royalty cap that was put into place by the Reserve Bank of India. This royalty cap says that if it is meant for domestic sales, and there is technology transfer, that means patented technologies, maximum royalty can be 5% of sales price. And if it's meant for foreign market, maximum royalty can be 8% of sales price. When there is no technology transfer, that means just trademark uh, implications, then uh, maximum royalty is 1% for domestic sales, and 2% for foreign sales. Uh, this is precisely what allowed uh, Qualcomm uh, Reliance to negotiate royalty with Qualcomm uh, in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, when uh, Reliance was launching CDMA phones in India, uh, Qualcomm insisted on 7% or 8% royalty for patents on the communication standards. But Reliance could say, this is illegal according to Indian law. Uh, we can pay only 5%. That's the maximum. Of course, as you know, there are potentially tens of thousands of patents in a mobile phone. And paying 5% just for the communication standard is not really uh, a proper implementation of the royalty cap. Ideally, the 5% should cover all patents. Uh, ever since the royalty cap was lifted in 2009, uh, there has been dramatic change. There was a government study of 20 companies and which, which found that royalty had tripled from 2008 to 2011. And very interestingly, uh, the chairman of ITC, is one of the biggest companies in India, the, formerly the Indian Tobacco Company. Now they don't ex expand the acronym anymore because they're involved in almost everything. 
uh, in his speech to the annual general assembly and annual general meeting of the shareholders in July 2013, he quotes two uh, research findings. One by the Economic Times Intelligence Group that uh, looked at outgoing royalty and said that outgoing royalty had tripled in the last five years. And uh, 300 listed companies were now paying royalties of $3 billion annually. Remember in 2010, uh, the total bill for the whole country was only $2.4 billion. Now only the listed companies account for $3 billion. He also quoted a business standard research that said that 75 of the listed companies on the Bombay Stock uh, Exchange uh, paid 32% of their net profits as royalty. So royalty has dramatically increased. I'll uh, quote a line from his speech that shows you how intellectual property law also intersects with tax law. He says, since foreign brands entail a royalty outflow, a similar percentage of turnover of Indian brands should be admissible as deductible expense for the computation of corporate tax to create a level playing field for domestic enterprises. He's basically saying that foreign entities are able to extract royalty and the Indian subsidiary calls it an expense, therefore they don't pay tax on it either, so the government should give Indian competitors a similar tax break. As you all know, the Indian rupee has lost more than 10% against the dollar this year, and our current account deficit has grown to 4.8% of our GDP. So the Department of Industrial Policy and Planning is thinking of reintroducing the royalty cap. If they do, then negotiating a reasonable compulsory license on the LTE pool or the device level pool will become an easier task. Thank you so much. Uh, so I hope we can all agree that that was the best talk you've ever heard at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, um, and I hope you can also agree why we invited Sunil to kind of cap off the day. This, this idea really came from the Global Congress last year, where at the end of a very long day of incredibly interesting talk, Sunil got up and kept everybody just really raptured with these stories of what's going on in intellectual property and technology in India. And so I know everybody is really dying to kind of jump into questions and answers and discussion, in which we are going to do, but we're going to do it Irish style, which means we're going to go over to room 600 and have beer. <laughs> so thank you very much.